knowing that they are going to join us and uh, we have a quorum, so we can. Uh, all right, so um, I'm going to call this meeting to order. First thing is to review and approve the agenda. Are there any changes folks would like to make to the agenda? Nope. Okay, I don't have any changes myself, so. Uh, um, and yes. It, this is just minor, but you might want to move the discussion of the exec, you know, the hotel garage stuff after all the reports. Oh, okay. Yep, sure. That's fine. Um, that no that makes sense. There's no to voting me. on that, I don't think so. Right. Okay. Uh, so we'll uh, anticipate switching those or moving the garage item till after uh, council reports, or actually after all of the reports. Um, all right. Any other changes folks want to make? Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved um, as amended there. So on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment um, and uh, yeah, about anything that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, and uh, if you would say your name and where you're from and um, uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes, uh, that would be great. And that is true for basically all the comments tonight. Um, yeah, um, great. So Laura, recording in progress. Oh, good. Okay, um, Laura, go ahead. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to say a little update on the Capital Area Neighborhoods Program. I'm. I guess I should say I live on Liberty Street, just so everybody knows. Um, and I'm working for Sustainable Montpelier. But uh, yeah, we've been working to help the capital area neighborhoods uh, get re-energized since the start of the pandemic. And we've been working with around 30 volunteers who are coordinating about 20 neighborhoods in Montpelier. Um, and just so the public knows about CAN, it's here to promote civic engagement, community, or communicate important information from the city to neighborhoods and from neighborhoods back to the city, and also from neighbor to neighbor. And so it's really here to help build a resilient community. And right now, four neighborhoods are planning neighborhood focused events for the July 3rd weekend. And two weeks ago, we met with Dan Groberg, the Montpelier Live Director to talk about this. And there's a lot of support in keeping the July 3rd event idea alive, even though the parade can't happen this year. So the neighborhoods that are working on planning some neighborhood based events are Mountain View for something on July 3rd. Loomis Street's going to do a concert on July 4th. And then the downtown neighborhood is focusing on trying to get a Langdon Street open streets event. Um, so we're working on that application and hopefully we'll have that too for the next city council meeting. Um, and Prospect Street, they're also planning to have some sort of neighborhood event, but they're still working that out. So we'll keep you in the loop on these ideas as they progress. And if anybody has any questions about CAN, you can always reach out to me, uh, Laura at sustainablemontpelier.org. And we have a phone number too, which I can always share. And that's it. Great. Thanks, Laura. Any questions? For Laura at this point. Great job, okay. Laura. <laughs> yeah, so grateful um, for all for all your work. All right, other uh, comments. Uh, Steve Whitaker here. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, one of uh, our uh, chronic homeless persons came close to death. Uh, a nurse happened to stop by and check the pulse and find the person foaming at the mouth, flies, unconscious flies fall, while climbing in and out of his mouth uh, in the heat. Uh, obviously alcohol was involved. Uh, and my request to the city manager and Ken Russell, et cetera, about cooling spaces went unanswered for the last several days. So uh, if that's what it's gonna take, is somebody dying, uh, you know, We've got people sleeping under bridges, and if you 
you you all think that's okay, then there's something wrong with you. You know, uh, these, these things are not okay, and we're about to see a tsunami or, or hundreds of people uh, exiting the hotels, and there is no plan to accommodate them. Uh, secondly, our garbage cans are being filled by Friday. By Saturday, they're overflowing. By Monday, they're stinking. Uh, combined household trash and animal waste. Uh, a nice older retired couple from New York got out of there in front of the liquor store and said, this is worse than New York, you know? And I, I said, I'll, I will quote you at the city council meeting. Uh, so that's something to be proud of. The, the smallest, cutest capital city, mismanaged capital city. Um, we're tying up three city trucks in a vastly decade behind public works backlog of unfinished projects. We're tying up three city trucks, entire days or week for the next week or more to plant trees. The tree planting is an admirable task, but it should be done with private contract labor. Our public works is overextended, understaffed, and way behind the eight ball, and they should not be tying up trucks, planting trees, you know, building swimming pool size, you know, it's state of the art. I don't fault the ambitious technology to make the trees healthy, but that's not what our public works department should be tied up doing. Um, there's more, but that's probably my two minute mark. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, anyone else? I like to discuss those things sometimes, you know? Anyone else? And uh, by the way, you can uh, use the raise hand icon, which is under reactions, or you can unmute yourself um, or turn your camera on and just uh, physically wave. Um, all of those options work. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so we're going to move on then uh, to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to move the consent agenda. I'll second. <laughs> Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that is unanimous. We have four votes, so we are good to keep going, I think, then. Uh, all right, so uh, we're up to the Housing Task Force annual report. Um, and for this, uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, shall I turn it over to you or to Polly? <clears throat> well, you can turn it over to Polly. Polly put together the presentation for tonight. Okay. Great. City Welcome, Council. Polly. Thank you. Thank you for um, taking the time to let us give you a report. And um, we wanted to talk about the housing situation in Montpelier, which um, I think uh, you are aware of, but we wanted to give you some specific data and also um, make some recommendations that the task force has discussed. So I am going to share my screen and hopefully that will work. Um, nope, let's see. Yep, that works. Great. Can you, can you see it? Uh, yeah, you may want to go something like um, uh, presentation mode or something. Oh, there we go. There okay. it is. Great. Okay. Um, so before I start, um, I wanted to acknowledge some of the members of the task force and others who helped gather the information. Um, first and foremost, Kevin Casey from the city, um, from whom a lot of the, the data came. Um, Liz Genge and Patty Dupuy. Du we from Down Street, Brian Evans and Carolyn Redpath, who are um, members of the task force, and also Rick DeAngelis from Good Samaritan. Um, I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about the task force, since there are a few new city council members since the last time we presented. Very quickly, we were established in 1999, and um, we are a group of citizens interested in housing issues. There's one representative from the city council on the task force, and that's Jack. And Jack's been on uh, for a long time, thankfully. Um, 
And our current members include residents representing the Montpelier Housing Authority, Down Street, Green Mountain Habitat, the Homelessness Task Force, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, Vermont Interfaith Action, City Council, and um, just private citizens with an interest in housing. Um, when we were created, the purpose that was outlined was to gather and evaluate information regarding housing trends in the city, to develop responses to housing concerns that are identified, and to recommend policies concerning housing to Montpelier city government. And that's um, largely why I'm here tonight. So um, what I'm going to talk about are um, a little bit of data on population, household composition income, and then tell you about rental housing, home ownership, people who are without homes, um, short-term rentals, and um, lay out some conclusions about what we know. So this um, is census data for Montpelier from 2019. Um, and I think you, you probably know a lot of this. Um, the number of people in our city has been declining. The estimated decrease since the last census is about just over 6%. 20% um, of the population is over 65, 20% is under 18, and the median age is 45, um, which is slightly higher than the state median, which I believe is like 42. Um, not surprisingly, most people in Montpelier are white and were born in the US. And our household size is relatively small. It's just over uh, two people per household. And our median household income, according to the census um, between 2015 and 2019, was a little bit over $65,000, um, which is a, a little bit higher than the Washington County median and a little bit higher than the state median, but, but not by much. So rental housing, um, approximately 44% of our housing stock is rental, and there are virtually no vacancies right now in rental housing, both in the, mark, in the unsubsidized market and the subsidized market. Um, prices are really high. Um, the average market rent is almost $1,400 a month. And I did some research on, you know, some websites where people might go if they were looking for an apartment, and there were only six listings, um, and there were four one-bedroom apartments, prices ranging from a thousand dollars a month to twelve hundred dollars. There was one three-bedroom apartment at fourteen fifty, and a four-bedroom house at twenty-five hundred dollars a month. So not exactly very affordable. Um, I talked to representatives from Montpelier's two largest landlords. And interestingly, the two largest landlords um, are Down Street Housing and the Montpelier Housing Authority. And um, Down Street, and, and this figure is slightly different than in the version that, that was um, given to you because I made a mistake, but um, they, own 181 apartments in Montpelier, and they say for the past few months, it's been between 98 and 100% occupancy. The only time there's a vacancy is when they're doing apartment turnover. And their property manager said she's never seen it like this. And she thought if there were new apartments created, they would fill right away. Montpelier Housing Authority owns 185 apartments. They're all subsidized. Um, they have a long waiting list for both apartments and portable vouchers. And um, Joe Triano said she can fill apartments as soon as she can turn them over. They've had trouble filling some of them because of um, supply chain issues, having to wait months for a refrigerator or a stove or something that, that an apartment needs. But um, as, as soon as an apartment's ready to go, they can rent it immediately. And, she said what she sees also with the private landlords who she deals with through the voucher program is there are just no vacancies. And um, she thinks it's a lot worse than normal. This chart 
shows you the rent trend between 1980 and 2018. And obviously it's out of date, but the reason for including it is you can see where rents are going. Um, it's just a, a steady upward line. The next thing I wanted to talk about was home ownership. 56% of our housing stock is owner occupied. The median price for a single family home last year was just shy of $300,000. And for a condo, just a little over $200,000. Um, our homes in Montpelier appreciated 143% between 2000 and 2020. And again, there is not much available. Um, the MLS listings for May only had six active listings and two of them were on the market for over a million dollars. Um, something I certainly never thought I would see in Montpelier. Right. Yeah. Um, the median price was um, $326,500 and um, the range was uh, from 193,000 for a two bedroom condo to 1.35 million for a four bedroom single family home. Um, similar to what I did with rentals, I looked at, on some of the websites and there were seven listings only with a range from $209,000 to $1.35 um, million. So, and, and those are, uh, those were, mostly the same listings that the MLS had. So what does this mean for affordability? Well, if a buyer earns 120% of county median income, which is approximately $78,000, they're able to afford a mortgage of about $225,000. So you can see that um, for what's considered a moderate income, household earning above median homes in Montpelier are pretty much unaffordable unless they have a lot of help with the down payment. So what can we conclude about buying a home in Montpelier? Well, interest in buying and living in Montpelier remains high among prospective buyers. Um, realtors report that most homes are under contract within a few days of going on the market. And frequently um, there are bidding wars with the successful buyer often paying more than the asking price. And, um, you know, going through the statistics, it, it looks like um, that's been between this year and last year, $1,000 and $27,500 above the asking price. And, um, it's the trend seems like 2021 there's even more of that than there was in 2020 and many of these buyers have cash and don't need a mortgage um so if you're a first-time home buyer young family that's that's the competition um, i talked to down street's home ownership center um director and her characterization of montpelier was they have a lot of interest um, among the people who they serve who would like to live in Montpelier, but they really just can't afford it. Once in a while, there's a condo that they can afford. So I um, wanted to touch just briefly on people without homes. I know that um, you hear from the homelessness task force, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. And um, But from the data um, that we were given, there are, it, it's, it's Washington County data, it's not Montpelier data. So um, between 280 and 350 unhoused households in Washington County, most are single adults and 14% are households with children. In mid-May, there were 95 rooms and motels used to house people without housing. And you know some of those were families, some of those were single folks. And um, at the end of June, there's going to be between 50 and 100 people who are going to lose those motel vouchers and could be out on the street. And very sadly, um, in the Montpelier Housing Authority had to turn down 15 additional vouchers because uh, 
for, because there just was no place to put people in Montpelier. So um, this is a chart um, of the that comes from the um, Vermont Coordinated Entry System, where people um, kind of enter the system to receive homeless services for for people who who don't have homes. It does not include Burlington and the Chittenden metropolitan area, but you can see. Washington County, we are unfortunately leading the pack um, in um, homeless households, mostly single adults. Um, this dark blue area is uh, an adult with at least one child. I think the only good news in any of this is we don't seem to have a lot of homeless youth um, without an adult, the, the green, is um, homeless, homeless youth who, who, who don't live with an adult. And then short-term rentals, which certainly all over the state are being talked about and have impacted um, the availability of apartments. And um, this is the most recent data. It was prepared in 2019 by Airbnb. And you can see kind of, um, shockingly, that Montpelier has the fourth highest number of Airbnb rentals in the state. And um, what surprised me is that it's higher here than most resort towns, including Dover, Wilmington, Waitsfield, you know, all the, the places that you, that you think are getting a lot of tourists. Um, there are more in Stowe, but um, it's you know, in declining order, Burlington, Rutland, Stowe, and Montpelier, and obviously Burlington and Rutland are, are very much larger than us. Um, one thing that I, I meant to include, and I didn't, this has been a topic of conversation at a housing summit that the city of Burlington held last year, and what they are considering doing or are already doing um, about short-term rentals is um, if you're going to convert a year round dwelling to a short term rental, you have to get a permit and the owner has to live on the property. They are considering uh, charging a housing replacement fee when conversions occur. And um, also if there are more than three units in, in a building or on the property that are um, being used as short term rentals, they are defined as a hotel and they are allowed only in the zoning districts where hotels are allowed. So um, it's it's definitely that is something that's being talked about all over the state. We um, in our recommendations, I, I we don't have anything around short-term rentals because it's also something that the legislature's been been wrestling with. So we want to see what they're going to do. So the conclusions from the data are um, Montpelier remains a desirable community. Both homeowners and renters want to live here. And our housing market is extremely tight for both groups. Um, there are virtually no rental vacancies, nor properties for sale. I, I think the market is just really stuck. And, um, you know, we talk about downsizers and people who may want to move from a large single family home, but there aren't a lot of options. If, uh, or places for them to go if they want to stay in Montpelier. So I think it's it's kind of contributed to the stock market. Um, prices continue to increase significantly, both for rentals and home ownership. And very few new homes have been built since 2000. I think maybe 5% of our housing stock um, has been built since 2000. And so basically low and moderate income households are being priced out of the Montpelier market unless they're fortunate enough to get a subsidized apartment. Um, I did some research on, you know, what are people doing elsewhere in the country? What does the state um, recommend? And um, these next two slides are a list of, of tools for municipalities. And I think um, you got them in, in your materials. I'm not going to read through them with you. I, um, 
I highlighted the ones that Montpelier hasn't done yet. And, and I have to say the city has done a lot. I mean, when you look at this list, much of it is, oh yeah, you know, city does that, the city's done that, the city's done that. So it's, it's really um, not for lack of, of trying, but, um, and some of these are not appropriate for Montpelier. Um, you know, inclusionary zoning is a powerful tool, but you have to have development um, for it to work. Um, so, um, anyway, and there's more here. Um, you can see some of them, like a TIF district, we've already done. We have a housing committee, we have a housing trust fund. Um, so I hope I hope you'll take the time to, to look this over. And then um, at our last housing task force meeting, we spent quite a bit of time um, talking about, well, what do we want to recommend to the city council? And there's certainly, um, this is not an all-inclusive list, and, and um, there's probably many more ideas out there, but um, I did want to go through them. So um, the first is to hire a consultant to examine the housing situation in Montpelier and make recommendations. Maybe there's something that um, you know folks who, who live and work here are missing and maybe some outside um, eyes might have some ideas. Um, the second recommendation was to reconstitute the barriers to housing committee. This was a committee that was set up by the city council 10 years ago. Um, so obviously this is, this is not a completely new problem. And um, the purpose of the committee would be to understand what's happening in the market and make recommendations. And we would just suggest that there be representatives from the task force, city council, the planning commission, the homelessness task force, um, sustainable Montpelier and city staff. Um, so the idea is maybe with a broad group of people, um, folks could come up with, with some, some ideas that haven't already been tried. Um, undertake an inventory of potentially developable properties that could accommodate 10 or more units. This may have been done already when the um, zoning was revised, but I think it's important for us to you know, know where those properties are and keep an eye on them and, and try to encourage some development there. Fund the housing trust fund at a level of $150,000 annually. Um, next one is support a shared appreciation homeownership pilot for first time home buyers. And um, Down Street actually has one in the works. This um, would involve giving a um, household a subsidy that's high enough that they could enter into the market, but in return, when they went to sell, they would limit the percentage of appreciation that they would take um, on the home. And the traditional model is they would take 25% of the appreciation and the remainder um, would just stay with the home. And so it would be affordable to the next buyer. Um, it's it's a program that's been used all over the state and Down Street does have um, some shared appreciation homes in Montpelier, but the state subsidies have been very limited. So there really, right. really aren't many. Um, and we're, you know, we, we were recommending using some housing trust fund money to, to try that as a pilot. Uh, the next one is explore instituting a land value tax that taxes long-term vacant buildings um, and highly developable properties at a higher value than occupied real estate. And the idea here is if there are people who are sitting on highly developable land, that's certainly their right, but um, make, them, make them pay a higher tax. I'm not sure if that's allowed under Vermont law, so it might involve working with the legislature on enabling legislation. The next one, um, this, this was tried a while ago and um, didn't succeed, but um, there's new people in the legislature and we feel strongly that um, it makes sense to relook at working with the state of Vermont 
maybe about making some of the large state parking lots available for housing. You could do parking on the ground floor um, or, and maybe the floor above and then housing above because there's some large vacant properties downtown that are just used um, for parking for state employees. Um, then acquire land and make it available for housing development. We think that the situation is dire enough that this is something that the city may want to seriously consider doing. Um, you might want to employ the services of a you know, professional real estate developer to do some negotiation. Um, might involve creating a land bank um, and using either city funds or funds from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to do so. But that way the city would, would be in control and could reach out and, and find a developer who would develop what, what we want. Work with the Vermont College of Fine Arts to determine if there are possibilities for housing in some of their underutilized buildings. Um, my understanding is that that is a possibility. Um, the next one is if a property goes up for tax sale, give first option to purchase to a nonprofit. And it, it sounds like there aren't a lot of properties that go up for tax sale, but um, you know, should that happen, if a nonprofit like Downstreet could get an option on it, they could get a lower moderate income family into the home. Continue the accessory dwelling unit program. It's a pilot right now. It's got some constraints because of the federal funds, but um, it's a really good way to get more apartments into some existing buildings, and it's a very low impact way. And um, finally, support programs to reduce homelessness, to recognize the challenges and changing landscape of homeless services and to support state and local programs and to allow the housing trust fund money to be used to support a project to house those without homes outside of Montpelier. That's a little unusual, but it's a regional problem. And um, so that's what we are recommending. And finally, as I was doing the, as I was putting this together, I came across the following, um, and it's from the New Yorker, it's from last week, and it just sort of shows that we are not alone in this. So I'm not going to read it to you, but I'll go slowly enough that you can, you can see it, but it's entitled How to Beat Out Cash Buyers When Trying to Buy Your First House. Good humor, Molly. Good humor. And somebody, e somebody email that. That. Okay. And so here's here's the conclusion, which hopefully is not going to be true in Montpelier. So that's that's it, and um. I don't know if, if anyone has comments or questions or. Great, thank you. Um, just so we did have a, a request to send this out. So um, this is a, a newer version, right? Than was in our packets, is that correct? Um, so the, I think Mary sent you the PowerPoint okay. and the only slide that was changed was um, I had the number of units that downstreet has in Montpelier wrong. So okay. it's it's one of those. Um, but otherwise you you have it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh so Connor, I saw you had a hand. Go ahead. Yeah, thank thanks very much, Polly. That's a pretty depressing uh presentation, but really, really <laughs> well done, you know. It's uh, some of those uh, some of those stats hit pretty hard. What are the ones I like I, I'm trying to reconcile I, I I think I have an idea, but how do you reconcile the population going down 
and virtually no homes or like rentals being available. Is that like second homes? Is it less people with families moving to town? I'm just trying to get my head around that. So I'm not an expert on that, but I think what a lot of what has happened is people who moved here, um, you know, when they were young, they had kids, have stayed in their homes. And so the household size has gone down. There are an awful lot of couples and single people who are occupying larger homes. And um, there isn't, there aren't a whole lot of places for them to go if they want to stay in Montpelier. So I, I, I think that's, I think that's some of that. And Connor, just to also put it in perspective too, with 230 units going to Airbnb and short-term rentals, you're going to reduce your overall population, although you don't lose the number of units, they just, they're not full-time residents. Um, and so, you know, there is a, it's not an insignificant impact when that transition occurs from long-term housing to, um, you know, to Airbnb and short-term rentals. Uh, it, it's a significant, if those numbers are truly correct from the state, you know, uh, taxation department and Airbnb, even. it's not insignificant. Uh, one more question. Um, I, I think the, the scariest thing I saw was, you know, just the average rental price there, right? It's like, if you're in your 20s, if you're like, if you're a server in town, like, how in the world could you afford that? Has the has the committee looked at all, um, this is pretty controversial, probably get in trouble, but um, at like rent stabilization policies, I think it would take a charter change. I don't think we could do it unilaterally. Uh, but have you thought about rent stabilization, how that works, what impact it has? It's you know, we haven't talked about it. I mean, I know um, from friends, you know, who, who like lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts or New York or, you know, in places where they had or have rent stabilization, there can be a lot of unintended consequences. I mean, it does hold the rents down, but um, it also tends to impact the condition of the apartment. And, um, so it's it's definitely something to look at, but it may not be a, a panacea. You also run into the situation too, where you get people who, you know, where you would have the downsizer situation where people, like they're stuck in their big homes now, they would be stuck in their apartments because it doesn't make sense for them to leave if they've lived in the same place for 20 years and the rent is stabilized. Um, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna give it, give up that rent stabilized unit. You run into the same unintended consequences of basically like primogeniture. Everybody ends up with giving it, handing it down to their oldest. And the next thing you know, you've got five generations in a rent stabilized apartment. Um, yeah, there's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Hey, thanks very much, guys. Sure. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. The, the last comment reminded me there's a Kurt Vonnegut short story, I think, that, uh, that ties in with that, in which the people are fighting for the bed within <laughs> the apartment um, that they all live in. Um, my question goes to really um, when we're looking at housing um, needs, you know, is there a specific sort of category? Uh, of need, um, you know, is it is it um, for lack of maybe a more nuanced term, a starter home, uh, you know, sort of for younger families or for people wanting to downsize and get out of their larger unit, or um, you know, sort of uh, you know, I, uh, smaller homes that might be more affordable, um, or or is it is it the subsidized housing that's that's really driving? You know, what, what, where are some of these, where are the gaps, I guess? I think, and, and um, Kevin looks like he wants to jump in, but I think it's <laughs> all of the above. Yeah. You know, I spent um, a career working in affordable housing, and that was the lens that I looked at everything through. But um, in the, you know, work with the housing task force, I've really come to think, we need market rate housing, we need subsidized housing, we need starter homes, we need housing for seniors who, you know, who don't necessarily qualify for subsidized housing and maybe, but maybe can't afford something like Westview. Um, it's, 
we, we need it all, I think. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with Polly on that one. I mean, there's, um, you know, when you look at the market from 0% vacancy rates for market rate and subsidized rental, you know, when 5% is your mar is your, um, you know, your bellwether for a healthy housing market, um, and you have functional zero. Uh, the only time you see a, an empty apartment is because they, they're gonna spend some time working on it or something needs to be done. Um, but, you know, as far as the housing market is concerned too, you, you also run into the situation of, like Polly's data showed that, you know, if, if you're at 120% of area median income, you're making $78,000 a year, you can afford a $225,000 house. There are no $225,000 houses available because the moment they hit the market, they're now $275,000 after bid, being bid up. So you really do run into the situation and it's something that like I've advocated for before is that, you know, by having things like a land bank or, you know, where the, the city has to play that role of, of doing, um, or the state or federal government, whoever it is to subsidize some of those development costs so that you offset the 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 total cost otherwise you know your construction costs at two hundred dollars a square foot quickly push you um to that limit before you've you know sure. included anything else well look, let me let me follow up on that if i if i may um you know when you talk about these these construction costs and subsidizing it um Okay, um, obviously that's that's one solution. Um, and is it just simply the per square foot cost of building a home, um, or are there, you know, are there other ways to sort of drive down the cost of, of the home uh, building costs? Well, you know, if you're per two thousand two hundred dollars a square foot, and let's say just for math's sake, it's um, a, a thousand square foot home, small home. You're looking at two hundred thousand dollars, but you haven't, you know. But if you take into account your, you know, acquisition costs of say seventy-five or eighty thousand for land, plus your utility hookups, you're over three hundred thousand dollars without, you know, putting a curtain rod up. So it's, you know, whereas that's kind of what I'm saying is that you know where the city has. Sure. No, sorry, I'll, I'll let oh, you. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say is that you know that's why when you look at you know whether the city you know were to undertake something like a land bank um, where we're eating some of the um, the hard infrastructure costs um, and you know making the lots available at a reasonable um, rate, looking at it as a long term investment to create new neighborhoods, um, then you have the potential for. Um, developers coming in and saying, okay, we can make this work. All right. Well, I'm wondering too, if there's anything like, you know, and this, this is, I think something that's come up every now and then, but whether there's zoning bylaws or building code requirements, such as sprinklers or such that, you know, are having, or is that a negligible kind of impact? I think at this point it's a negligible impact. I, I, you know, when you look at, you know, historically people would say, oh, it's the zoning, you know, but when you talk to the developers now that are looking at Montpelier, um, they're like, wow, this is, the zoning's great. You know, the, 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 the numbers look great. Like, you know, um, there's a demand and everything else, but there's lack of available um, land um, that is right for development or is owned uh, currently by people who are not able to develop it. So, um, yep. yeah, I, I take it. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Jeff. I think the changes to the zoning were terrific in terms of encouraging housing. Um, really, really good. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think some of the changes in zoning we did a few years ago are are great. We uh, it's possible we have more density. It's possible for people to turn their houses uh, that they live in into duplexes. Um, 
Paula, you mentioned the accessory dwelling unit program, and I think that there, that might be something that people aren't aware of. So it might be worth uh, talking about that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I can take that one. It's um, your baby. You want to talk yeah. about it? <laughs> um, so that uh, the accessory dwelling unit program, which is funded in part by Vermont Community Development Program funds, which is indirectly from HUD. Um, we're partnered with the Vermont State Housing Authority and Tyler Moss is running it. The challenge has been Tyler is now in charge of the rental assistance program for the state, uh, which is, you know, if people can't pay the rent, so the hundred, like $153 million is the number here, not insignificant. So he's busy, um, but we're, we've still moved through a few of them. The challenge is, is that um, there's a lot of interest. We have run into challenges with the HUD funding because what we were originally told we could do things like, um, you know, detach structures or um, they changed it kind of last minute. So um, it's a great program. It gives people up to $20,000 um, plus a $10,000 um, interest-free loan. To, so a total of $30,000 to put an accessory dwelling unit on their property. And it just needs to be affordable um, for five years. Um, so it provides a significant amount of money for homeowners to um, to participate. And on top of that, too, the eligibility is flexible. So either the unit needs to be flexible or needs to be affordable, or the homeowner qualifies uh, as low income, lower moderate income. So if you're retired when you have a home um, and, you know, you've got some equity you could use some of your equity to build the unit and get the grant uh, and loan up to thirty thousand dollars to offset those costs um, so it's, it's a great program we just have to get through the last few it's a pilot and kind of long term it's a really one where it's kind of a no-brainer um, as far as you know a public um, investment when you look at affordable housing units are usually you know, two hundred and twenty to three hundred thousand dollars a piece per unit. Whereas, if we make a fifty thousand dollar contribution, and we have a, you know, or sorry, a thirty to fifty thousand dollar contribution um, per unit, we have an affordable, affordable unit in place. So, it's one tenth the cost. If I recall, there were more people who wanted to get into this program than we had uh, slots available to. Yeah. Uh, and and just to follow up on that, Jack, too, we, the pandemic really kind of hit the program hard. There were a number of projects that were in process and almost overnight last March and early April, people just said, I don't know if I'm gonna have a job. I don't know what's gonna happen. Everything shut down. So this we're gonna put on hold. Um, I think one of them has been re resurrected in, the, in this, this spring to, that's underway. So. Um, but there's still interest. It's just, I think people were waiting for the, the world's situation to stabilize. Thanks. Uh, so I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, thank you, uh, Polly and Kevin. This is uh, excellent. Uh, it's, um, it, may, it, may, it may not be encouraging, but I, I appreciate that there are suggestions. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna focus on those. And so I, when I see this list of suggestions, particularly the ones that you're making recommendations um, to the council about, um, my, my head organizes them in a kind of graph, I guess you could say, where on one axis, it's like, is this easy or is this hard? And then on the other axis, it's like, will this have a, a really direct impact or like an indirect impact? And uh, so obviously we, I wanna, like if we can, what are the things that are easy to do and will have a direct impact? And there's nothing that really fits clearly in that category and that's fine. Um, but just thinking about um, where other things fall on, on that scale, um, there are a couple things that jump out to me that I think are really interesting. Unfortunately, they're pretty hard, but I, I maybe I'll save those. There's a couple things on here that feel really, um, obvious maybe is uh, a word I would use. Um, one is, you know, if our 
fund if our revenue allows getting back to um, funding uh, you all at I feel um, I feel like at the, previously we were funding you at like 140,000 um, annually um, maybe I, I have to go back and check but but funding you at 150,000 um, annually like that is of interest uh, to me and that's something that we you know we wouldn't do now we'd be talking about that for um, during budget time also the continuing the ADU program uh, you know as that comes up that feels worth worth doing um, you know because I know we're in a pilot program now but when it ceases to be a pilot and and is something that we should adopt um, that's that's certainly of interest um, you know I, I'm also interested in this last bullet uh, allowing the Montpelier housing trust fund money to be used to support um, those without homes um, you know that's I'd, I'd love to see that fleshed out a little more but that's that's certainly um, something that it feels like, especially if that it's just like a permission that you need. I mean, there's there's certainly trade offs there. Like, oh, maybe it's not going to a house in Montpelier, but is that um, necessary? Um, so that you know, that's that's certainly a conversation. There's there's two others though that jump out. Well, yeah. So. Let me back up. So one is not actually listed here, and I'm curious about your thoughts on it. Um, I'll, I'll start with that one. One of the things that I feel like I'm taking away from this conversation is the substantial impact of short-term rentals. And that feels like it's worth addressing, and I don't see that on your list of recommendations. Um, seeing that like there's a there's 230 uh, you know short-term rentals out or hosts out there, and we've got potentially a hundred new um, folks facing homelessness in the next couple months like that is somehow very well it's very irritating right like and at the same time i understand like there's a need for short-term rentals blah 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 but um you know what can what can be done about that uh and so i, I oh, sorry go ahead polly yeah i've, I've got another one but I'll, I'll i'll hold on to it yeah go ahead it was on the list um okay. but because the legislature is trying to address it statewide we took it off figuring well let's wait and see what they do um you, you know i'm i'm not one to wait right like if we think there's a good solution uh i don't mind saying like let's let's okay. come up with what we think may be healthy what what would work for us and um and then get after it with the legislature i realize that's that's a heavy lift but um but I think we all recognize that there's there's this need. Anyway, I want to put that out there that that's okay. that's some that's something I'd be interested in. Okay. Um, I'm speaking for myself here, but um, that's that's one thing. And then as, as the second thing, and again, I realize that this is a heavy lift, but um, I have been interested in land based taxes uh, for a long time, and I, I think there are multiple reasons to pursue a uh, land value tax or land based taxes um and you know this in my mind this is adding one more reason to explore that when i when i think about both of those things um which would probably require charter amendments it it seems to me that those would be the kinds of things that you need a champion or a group of you need a group <laughs> to like to to vet it to talk about it um and yeah i'm well that's something that maybe warrants more conversation i don't know if other folks feel um like you you know that we know what that is um or if there's any interest in that uh but yeah, what's your what's your thought on on that with the land value tax or land based taxes? Mike. Oh, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I could jump in here real quick. The, the, one of the the hangups that comes up with the land based tax is that we of course have a statewide education tax rate. So, in order for us to implement it, we would basically have to have two assessments for every property. One that's the 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 state 
education assessment, and then we would have to have a local assessment. So that that's one complication. And then we would also have to then cut out the, um, the TIF district because we can't do anything um, outside of the ordinary to the TIF district. So we would only be looking at properties outside of the TIF district. So those would be just a couple of the, the major issues with uh, that, that approach to things um, just as off, off the top, it would be, it would require a certain amount of complicated. Um, and then the question we'd have to ask Steve Twombly, the assessor is whether our computer programs and our tax software actually would allow us to print tax bills and such. But um, from a, from a, ability to do it standpoint, those would be the, the barriers I would see to going mm -hmm. forward beyond having to actually get the state give us permission. I mean, my understanding of land-based taxes is that the algorithm would be pretty straightforward, right? Because it's based on the land and not what's on it, right? And so that assessment presumably would be pretty cut and dry. Um, separate from that, you do make a good point about the TIF districts. Um, so what space are we really talking about? And does it apply to places, to like the rurally zoned um, spaces? But it would be interesting to see, you know, outside of the TIF districts, uh, what, what space we're actually talking about potentially, uh, because there, there, may, there may be um, space that's, that's worth talking about for that. Um, there is at least one member of the planning commission who also very strongly supports the idea of the land-based tax tax system. Um, so it's it's not it's not something completely foreign that, that we haven't discussed. Certainly, it's come up in planning commission as well. Well, maybe I'll reach out to that planning commissioner and see if there is energy to put together a committee to explore it further. Um, uh, Dan and then Bill. Uh, the the only other concern that I, I would think about is uh, land the state land gains tax, um, and how that would have an impact on that. Because if if suddenly land values rise as a result of taxation, um, you know you might have homeowners that are you know the, in which the land gains tax is pretty harsh, um, it, depending on the number of years you own the land, um, and it can make a homeowner. It can make it un unaffordable to sell your home. Right. Okay. Fair enough. And um, Bill. Yeah, I wasn't going to really comment on the land tax. I think that there's a lot to look at there. I just, um, you know, and I think you were heading there, Madam Mayor, is we might want to take a look at these proposals and ideas and and put them, in, you know, one in the box of the things we have the authority and ability to do now that are within our discretion and. And, you know, whether it's a budget decision or those kinds of things uh, or within the current statutes or zoning and those that would require, you know, extraordinarily he heavy lifts. And, and now we can weigh the pros and cons of those policies and also those the political realities of, you know, are we going to really put a lot of effort into this only to find that, you know, PVI or somebody is just going to say, you know, they can't do that and the legislature shoots it down. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that will happen. I just think we, we can take a look at what's our what's this workload and this workload? Cause there are a lot of good ideas. And I think some of them, you know, whether it is just securing options on properties or those kinds of things to help people get in, um, helping, you know, buy down the cost of some of these homes, or maybe it's even, you know, counterintuitive, but helping support more expensive homes and thinking maybe people will go into those freeing up the other homes, you know? <laughs> so I think, but those are all things we can do um, without, changing the world, but we should be also looking at changing the world at the same time. Fair enough. Um, other thoughts or comments? Uh, Steve Whitaker. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, I, I marvel at the, the fair enough. Uh, 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 it's just the uh, this is an emergency. This this is not something that can stand for a couple of years of committee work. Uh, I'm reminded of your homelessness task force uh, that we we really need to think about accelerating like drastic measures to create uh, several categories of housing. 
uh, from, and I've just sent a few of you links to both the Conestoga huts, which are $2,000 for the homeless, and then $50,000 pre-assembled uh, uh, accessory dwelling units. Fixtures are already included in them. So you set, set them down on a foundation, even a light foundation, unfold them, and they're ready to occupy. So we, we really need to think about doing something, even if it's going to have to get rearranged later or relocated later. Uh, both of these solutions are, are appropriate for that. But you've got, you've got an emergency situation, whereas, you know, pre recreating the tax structure to disincentivize Airbnb or trying to place, you know, uh, socially atrophied uh, homeless people into Airbnb uh, tenancies is is really absurd. Uh, the, the, the owners will not tolerate that. So I think we need to look at real drastic situations that are going to both uh, take advantage of available land and housing. I'm thinking of the unused, you know, building between Trinity and uh, disability rights. Uh, unless Jacobs has somebody living in his attic up there in a commercial zone. But, but there's lots of properties that could handle uh, three, four, six uh, of these foldable accessory dwelling units at $50,000 a piece. And, you know, you, you need to start taking the pressure off with immediate action. I'll, I'll leave it at that and, you know, follow up with the appropriate people if there are any. Okay, thank you. Other can I can I follow on that? Uh, can I follow one more comment on that, Madam Mayor? Uh, I I had an opportunity with a an owner who had a property for sale that is really a teardown, but the site could handle six or eight units of affordable housing. But the the years of ineffective of ineffective government has eroded the trust that it is worth trying to battle this machine of City Hall to get these kinds of things permitted. The unequal enforcement, the favoritism, the, you know, you, we've, we've created a problem that's discouraging uh, creative affordable housing development. And that's a, that's a trust issue that you all got to deal with. And I didn't hear any mention of it. Well, thank you. Other thoughts or comments? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Well, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, we, I, there are a number of people still working in housing today who are work, who were on the uh, Barriers to Housing Committee back 10 years ago. And uh, it, in that, and I'm one of them, and certainly in that committee, one of the things that we found was that uh, among developers, there was an image that uh, the city of Montpelier was hostile to development and uh, you people just couldn't get things built here. And, uh, and it was also very clear then, and it's even more clear now that that image was, uh, was not factual and that uh, there, uh, the barriers that people claim claimed to exist to uh, to housing development simply aren't there. So I, I do not, I reject the uh, contention that uh, the administration of the city of Montpelier has been uh, engaged in incompetent and, uh, and unequal treatment of people who uh, are interested in, uh, in developing housing in, uh, in Montpelier. There, there are, reasons that it hasn't happened, but uh, being badly treated by the city, I don't think is one of them. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I like to be leaving a topic like this with some next steps. And I'm not totally clear on like, <laughs> like what do we think some of those next steps might be? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. 
<clears throat> I mean, I think one of the easy steps, I know the city of Burlington has been tackling uh, the Airbnb issue, um, you know, and so it might be a nice first step to see, you know, if staff can uh, obtain some of the material that, that Burlington has either promulgated or gone through to start, start that discussion. I mean, that's a difficult and fraught discussion because there are people that rely on Airbnb as a income source to help them afford to live in houses. And so, you know, I think that's something we just have to be careful about, but, you know, I think one of the points about that Kevin and, and Polly made is that this is having an impact. And at the very least, we should be having a discussion about it because there may be some low hanging fruit and there may be some, some issues that we can start to identify. Um, that that would strike me to be maybe a, an easy first first lift um and would go directly to the heart of some of the things they've been talking about yeah thank you um brian evans uh, good evening everybody um i am on the board of good samaritan haven and a member of the mount Kavir housing uh, task force i do want to uh just let you know that Good Samaritan Haven submitted a uh, an application for the housing trust fund. We are trying to secure the um, the Twin City Motel on the very Montpelier Road, which would provide quite a lot of uh, better housing space. Um, so I that goes to the uh, the final bullet on that list is that you know to be able to open that up for not just Montpelier is uh, is what we were hoping for as well, just so, thank you. You know, I almost feel like some of these could be um, brought to us sort of like one at a time. You know, if the, if the housing task force came to us with just a proposal around that, um, then we could, we could just zoom in on it, you know, address it, and then well, um, just start checking some of these things off. Yeah, just as a, an aside, we, you know, we will be calling together the Housing Trust Fund Committee to, um, to the process is the Housing Trust Fund Committee will vet that and then do a presentation to council to, you know, likely approve um, that recommendation um, to fund Good Sam with the Housing Trust Fund. Um, and we just have to go through the process because um, it will involve, uh, you know, a bit of an exemption, um, but it's it, you know, the important piece is, is recognizing the regional nature of this, that, you know, normally we our trust fund dollars do go directly to projects in Montpelier, whereas this would be unique. But at the same time, too, it's been such a, a council priority, task force priority, the homeless task force priority, um, and, you know, the administration that, uh, you know, that, that'll be coming up probably at the end of the month. Um, we're going to be meeting. I'm going on vacation this week, so I, I, I can't do it this week. But when I get back, um, I promise. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, that's coming up. Uh, that'll come up. We'll meet at the end of the month and probably in early July. We'll have it to you guys. So, oh yeah, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, and apologies, I was... Uh, late tonight for a fourth grade graduation. Um, so I, I might have missed, um, I, I, well, I missed a, the first half of the presentation, I think, so apologies. Is Are there like short-term next steps that um, Polly, you and, and the team had recommended tied to the um, like American Rescue Plan Act money and the fact that there's like unprecedented dollars in the state that are gonna be, you know, like they, the, the huge amount of money that's going to VHCB and um, other programs, like is, is the recommendation tied to the consultant or other things? Like how are we making sure that Montpelier is right, like right, right in line and taking as, you know, as much advantage of this moment and, and that the funding that's not normally there is, is that tied to that? And are there like short-term steps that you see would be necessary for us to be like as prepared as possible to take advantage? So the recommendations, um, were not tied to that in part you know, I talked to people at VHCB and they they were still kind of sifting through and trying to figure it out. Um, our NES task force meeting is next week and 
Mary Hooper is going to come and talk about what the legislature did and the opportunities that it um, presents. And um, Kevin's, Kevin's, as he said, isn't going to be here. You know, maybe I'm, I'm hoping Mike might be able to join us um, so we can have a conversation about um, are there opportunities for Montpelier. Um, I did mention the, um, you know, possibility of I, I asked the director of VHCB, um, you know, could some of the money that they're getting be used to capitalize a land bank um, if if Montpelier was interested in that? And he said he thought so, but again, you know, they they hadn't at that point gone through the details. So just to just to follow up on that with Holly is that that's that's pretty much the the general take is that. There is a lot of money coming from the federal government, but nobody knows exactly how it can be spent, where it can be spent, and who's going to spend it. So um, I, I think it's it's basically just keeping our ear to the ground and looking for opportunities. Um, but, you know, each of these could be capitalized using some of those funds, hopefully. Um, and it may not be appropriate in some cases to use federal funds. It may be, you know, something that the city needs to to take on um, because sometimes the strings of the the funds can be more onerous and counterproductive to what you want to achieve and um, than just doing it on your own. So. I don't think the city should be shy about asking. I mean, I worked as, as a funder for, for years and, you know, I mean, the worst you can get is a no and often um, it's something that they haven't thought of and, and they want to do it and they can think of, think of a way to do it. So I think if, if, um, if we have needs, which we do, um, we should, we should be right in there because certainly, um, Burlington and the Burlington folks are, are <laughs> going to be knocking down the door. So. Go ahead, Connor. Um, I may have missed it, but I, I thought that was a really good suggestion, um, reaching out to the college. Has, has there been any discussion so far? I mean, I could see that as such a win-win if they need to get rid of space and they have it, you know, it, it could really improve the vibrancy up, up on College Hill there. You know, they've got a cafe and everything, um, and it would seem like some of those buildings would be easier to convert to housing. So uh, I was just wondering what the next step might be on that one. I, yeah. I guess the question is, have we spoken to them yet? That's... Um, I, don't, I don't know who the we is. I know that um, at one point they were, they, I think, approached Good Samaritan to see if they could work with them. And for some reason that didn't work out, but um, that would seem to say that they are thinking about how can we be a good community partner and also what can we do with these underutilized buildings? Yeah, we'll make a plan to reach out. Okay. Great, thank you. <clears throat> it, it sounds sort of like there's multiple next steps um, here that that we're all throwing around. Um, Polly, Kevin, Mike, do you do you feel like you have a sort of a clear picture of what your some next ex, next steps might be? For, I mean, we've, we've talked about a number of them, but. Uh... I, I'm curious um, what your reaction to the idea of approaching the state about using some of the parking lots um, might be, because I, I, I think the city made some pretty serious efforts quite a few years ago, but the person who was negotiating um, on behalf of the legislature basically killed it and he's no longer there and um, you know, given that state employees, some of them may have more options for working remotely post pandemic. Will they really need all that parking? Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you think about that idea. Go ahead, Donna. Well, there's been past discussions with the state, but every time you mention a parking garage, it's their dollars. They sort of have walked away. 
maybe if there could be a deal where there was a way of covering some of their costs for the parking area, but we take a lot of negotiations. I think you should do it, we should do it, but it has not been uh, fulfilling to try in the past. Um, I would, uh, I might get in trouble for this one, but I'm not going to say it, but that, you know, in, in development, like, you know, the kind of your primary um, uh, goal is control, site control, owning the land and having that, um, that control of the site. So I think that's got to be kind of the primary goal, because what we've seen again and again, you know, in town is you can make incremental process progress on small projects like ADUs or, you know, maybe we do something with, with Airbnb, but none of those are a panacea. But when we look at some of the larger parcels or we look at the stuff that, you know, <clears throat> if we are going to look at development, it's going to have to come from, you know, us having control of those pieces and then making a determination, you know, with the community, how we want to proceed. Um, so that's just my thought, and that's why I like the land bank ideas, where where you, you know, you you come from a position of saying like, okay, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna maximize development for this area or this area, um, and and we're gonna do site control, and we're gonna take the lead on the master planning, and we're gonna take the lead on some of these pieces, um, or work with the developer that can that can do that, um, and has the experience to do that. So. That's just my take. Um, I think that until we until we have that control, I think it's going to be very difficult to make progress. Are you saying that just in general, or um, in yeah. response to? Okay. I think that you know uh, anything that we do, um, as far as like the ADU program, we can make some imp incremental progress and Airbnb. But if we're going to you know, really have an impact on this, it's going to be a larger development. Um, you know, when you have 0% vacancy rates and four homes on the market right now, uh, I mean, you're not, you're not, <clears throat> you're not going to piecemeal your way out of this one. This is going to take a big investment and, um, and partnership with people who know how to do it. I'm off for the land bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So that would require either finding some federal or local dollars to, to at least even start that conversation, right? Yeah, knowing knowing that there's a funding source, unless unless the city wanted to issue a, a housing some kind of housing bond to do it that way. Well, yeah, let's, so I would certainly be interested in um, hearing back from you all uh, as things progress and uh, keep us in the loop. If there's one thing that rises to the top, um, you know, come to us with like one ask <laughs> so that we can dive deep and, um, and then. And need five million uh, bucks. <laughs> okay, One ask. Give me five million bucks. We're good. All right. Okay. <laughs> Donna, go ahead. Well, I just wanted Polly to know that uh, Barbara Conry, uh, the architect teacher at, yep. at Vermont College, uh, Vermont Tech, she had a class that did several renditions of buildings with parking underneath, housing above, parking underneath, some retail and housing above, sustainable buildings all throughout downtown. So you might get in touch with her just because then you might have some concrete images and who knows that might fly on some opportunity of money in the future. It's not going to be immediate, but they were beautiful buildings and well purposed for those parking lots. Okay. She's actually coming to our next meeting, but with her planning commission hat on. Um, well, tell her, tell her you want the but, art. It's wonderful. We'll her back. Back. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. Okay, hey, any final thoughts on this? I think we probably need to move on. Okay. Thank you for All your right, time. Well, thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep, and certainly keep us in the loop, keep us updated.
okay. as to how we can help. Uh, all right, yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to utility rates, and I um, am assuming that I'm going to be passing this over to either um, Kurt Matika or uh, Donna Bella Casey or possibly Kelly. Oh, there's Kelly. Kelly turned her camera on. Awesome. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll go. Kelly, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so it's me. Um, I'm going to be doing the um, utility rates, um, and then we get into the master plan. They kind of flow together. Um, and so I've got it just a really quick presentation of slides to go over the greatest hits. Um, and so if I can, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And let me know if you can see it. Uh, yes, yes, we Perfect. can see it. So we'll just kind of get right into the history of the rates. Um, this was included in your packets along with the rate setting resolution. Um, last year we set rates in September um, and on the consent agenda, um, but I thought just given the times it might be worth um, doing a presentation to go over, you know, what we're proposing and how it ties in and hopefully um, year over year we can set rates before July 1 um, so they can just go into planning for folks as they consider their usage should um, they be impacted by increases or if they're level funded, which maybe not so much, but we've got a lot going on. So without further ado, this is a little bit blurry, so I apologize for that, but I just wanted to highlight a few areas to focus on. The majority of consumers um, of water and sewer are in the first tier of usage. Um, and for that, it's the, um, first five or 50,000 gallons of water used or uh, wastewater for um, a quarter. And so it's that this first column after the um, years here. And then if you come over here to the sewer meter rates, um, that's shown as well. And so for the water rates, just focusing on that first tier, and I'll get into it a little bit more um, from an impact perspective on the next slide. Um, but from 21 to 22, for that category, we would be going from 880 to 904. Um, and likewise, for sewer within the same category, we would be going from 995 to 1022. That represents a 2.7% increase. Um, additionally, I want to note that the fixed ready to serve charge would also go up from 230 to 236. Um, and so you can just see how the rates have changed in the last column over the years here. And so just getting into kind of what it means, I'm just gonna keep this pretty simple, um, but I did wanna kind of uh, show a range of consumers and show what it would mean on sort of an average bill. And so what I did is I pulled our quarterly consumption averages and then took a look at the different categories and so bucketed them. So in this first table, you can kind of see the number of accounts and the range and the um, where they are mostly. Mostly our users are within the 5,000 to 10,000 um, gallon per, per quarter range. Um, but I wanted to kind of factor in other users. Um, this list represents a total of uh, just over um, 2,500 users or so. Um, the total number of consumers um, across all users is uh, just under 3,000. So it just sort of gives you a sense of where this sits. And so you can see if you look at the impact annualized for water and sewer, you can see them separated out here, but then you can also see them combined. So if you're looking at between 1,000 and 5,000 gallons, annually the impact will be $18.87. If you're looking at 5,000 to 10,000, it's $27.09. And then if you're looking at 10,000 to about 20,000, you're looking at just under $40 annually of an increase. And so just thinking about what that means and the impact on users, that's what the annual increase would represent. Um, and I'll get into what this funds in the next slide, but you can kind of see the breakdown here, which I just mentioned based on the rate history, what our fixed annual ready to serve costs would go to and from, and then water and sewer. And then I also wanted to um, list the high top three users here down at the bottom, just so you could see on the other end of the universe and spectrum, you know, what folks are using. It drops off significantly from here, but 
this is the higher end of usage per quarter um, and we're number one. <laughs> so that's um, pretty interesting there. Um, but as I understand it, historically, it has gone between the city and uh, the hospital, um, which isn't really all that surprising. And then moving on into the recommendation here, um, this would be if, if you approve these rates and um, execute the resolution of the effective July 2021 um, for FY22 um, and would be seen on the um, December bill. Um, and this is representative of 1.7% inflation and then 1% for infrastructure, which tracks the master plan. Um, this funds infrastructure improvements, current and future upgrades of note um, here. Um, this will include phase one and two of the um, wastewater recovery facility, and then also East State Street project, which includes a, a series of things, um, sewer lines, water lines, um, combined sewer overflows, and also um, some street work. Um, the other thing that this does address, and we you know, work with Public Works extensively on rate setting, but also the master plan, um, there was some concern about asset depreciation and making sure that we had captured that accurately within our planning. Um, and I can say that this plan does address that. Um, we learned from our auditors that we either need to book um, the full amount of debt service or assets depreciated over time, whichever is greater. And so we've tested that and that's in the plan. So that's good. It just then will be square as we get down the line and need to replace things. Um, and so I also wanted to note here, I, I did run a little bit of a fly here. <laughs> I did run the current delinquency rate, so we're just up over 1%, which is pretty good considering, you know, what we've been through. Um, historically, people pay their bills um, and we're still seeing that. And so I think that's kind of an indicator that, you know, while the pandemic has definitely um, had some real impacts, um, the impact here isn't as significant. I mean, it's still, there is, you know, there are some delinquencies, but we are seeing people pay their bills. And so um, with that, you know, we'd recommend approving a rate increase for water and sewer of 2.7% um, and executing the resolution that was included in your packet. I do want to note there's two minor changes that will go um, with the resolution that you will sign that ties to this. And one of them that I noticed when I was looking at it is the readiness to serve um, quarterly fee was not updated in the resolution, so I updated that. And then the date on the last page should be June 2021, not 2020. So um, that's what I have for a quick presentation. And I'll stop my share here on rates. Um, I wonder if you have any questions. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Uh, this and Kelly, yeah, this may be more for Bill. Who would uh, looking at these historic rates? I'm just curious. It looks like about 15 years ago or more, there were these zero percent growth rate years. What what was the cause of that? There were a couple of factors. Um, one was that the Council at one point, I'm doing this from memory, uh, so I don't have that, all the data right here, but um, one was that the council had done a very large rate increase, at least for water, when the water plant first came on, and so they thought, said, you know, we'll even it off for a while. The other was, uh, at one point, I think at least the waterfront had a pretty large surplus, which has since gone away, so the council was having trouble raising the rates, and some of it was kind of just political decisions that they didn't want to raise rates. Um, and since then, you know, we've we've kind of had a roller coaster ride, particularly with the water fund, but with the sewer fund as well, where you know we had this big surplus and we had a deficit and it was pulled out of deficit, and the council has adopted this sort of incremental policy and I think got a better, much better hand. Um, we actually spent a long time, a couple of years, on looking at different uh, types of rates, and um, I, I think opted not to change those that were, you know, sort of deciding who the winners and losers were, and it wasn't obvious the, which way to go there. But um, I'm sure Ann and Ann and Donna at least can remember us looking at, you know, pretty extensively at, at different rates. And uh, so, 
we, you know, as Kelly mentioned, we've adopted the 1% over inflation in terms of dealing with the master plan, the capital work, and I, that's later on this agenda. And we've been trying to, stay, you know, we've found that if we can stay with inflation, at least operating wise, so far we've, we've been pretty good. Um, I don't know if that is a succinct answer, but that's the best I got right now. No, that I appreciate that. It just, it, it, and it explains, I mean, you know, looking back, there are these years of 0% growth. And then, like you said, like in 99, there's a 25% growth and, and then years of 3%, 10% and 6%, you know, and so I think it's, I, I certainly, that's sensible to me, this master plan and sort of a steady leveling out so that the funds are consistent and the rates don't suddenly drop or rise. Okay. Bill, am I wrong? I thought somewhere in there we also had some major requirement from the federal standard improvements that we did on some of the treatment. Was that any of the big increases? Well, of course, the biggest one was the construction of the um, the water treatment plant itself. That was a, a federal requirement. And then there have been some on the sewer side as well. Um, and the other, I think another area that we um, we had to make some adjustments is that we, when we went to full metering, uh, estimates had told us that metering would actually increase our revenues pretty substantially because people would were, you know, sort of overusing with their flat rates. And in fact, that, that didn't work. Um, uh, you know, we, w while we have accurate, now we have accurate reads of our water, uh, or more accurate, which is good. And people are certainly paying fairly. Um, it did not provide the boon that we thought it would as far as revenue. So then we had to do some revenue adjust, uh, rate adjustment to, to make up with that. I think the other thing to remember as far as sort of steady incremental rates is concerned is that to some extent people have, um, well, this, I don't mean this to be funny, but you know, water and sewer are, are liquid in terms of economic assets. So they can, people can, get low sh flow shower heads, low flow toilets, they can reduce their water use, they can you know, make other conservation efforts. Now, we've also seen a lot of, a lot of our major buildings have already gone through that national life, for example, when I think the state and others have really, you know, we saw big sort of controls on their usage, but it, it is, so, you know, a big rate increase can force a lower usage. So it doesn't always, just because we raise rates 10%, doesn't mean it's good, we're gonna get 10% more revenue, like, kind of does with the property tax. So, it, you know, I think we have to be cautious of making this manageable for ratepayers who are our homeowners by and large. I mean, obviously there's some big ratepayers too, but they, as, as they use more, they go into the higher categories. Um, and we are like our taxes. We, you know, we have a pretty expensive, pretty expansive water system with a lot of old lines that need major work. And we don't have a huge, you know, we could stand to have a lot more customers. As you know, we, we tried really hard to tie in the Berlin system and supply them, and that, that didn't work. So we are on the higher end. We're just, it's not like the property tax where we're paying for a large service with a small base. So. Yeah. Other thoughts or comments? Jack. I'm ready to move to uh, approve the proposed uh, rates, the proposed resolution. I'll second. And this includes the changes that Kelly described, the date at the end. Um, yes. There was one other thing you mentioned. Ready to serve quarterly rate. Yeah. Well, that you, That's your understanding, Jack and Donna? Yes. Okay. Uh, Lauren. Oh yeah, I just wanted to make sure we were with those amendments. Okay, okay. great. Um, further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed? All right. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Thanks for uh, that uh, update and that resolution. Um, oh, it is... So, you know, we didn't say at the beginning that we were going to take a break at 830. 
it is now almost 8.50. Uh, we did start later. What would you think about taking a break at 9? Is that okay, Donna? Okay. Oh, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. Okay, good. So we're going to aim to take a break at 9, roughly. Um, so for now, we're moving on to um, public restrooms uh, discussion. And so for this, I assume I'm either turning over to Bill or to Cameron. Actually, I think we're going to do the water sewer master plan update next. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I just totally skipped that. I'm, I. So you might want to do your break now because this might last one 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Sorry. The, the utility rates and the water sewer just merged together in my head, but they're separate things. Um, all right. Well, well, let's take 10 minutes right now. We'll come back at nine o'clock and we'll jump in uh, with the water sewer master plan update. Okay. All right, great. Um, so I will uh, kind of cruise through this presentation and we can do questions whenever. Um, Kurt is um, on and available if there are um, project specific questions um, that you have, um, but otherwise we'll go through it. Um, so uh, the last version of this plan uh, was established in um, May and approved in July of 2016. And since then, you know, we've seen some changes, um, some large changes. And so we thought it was a good opportunity to revise it and um, make it current with what we're experiencing today. Um, and so the, the um, goal of this plan is really to uh, establish steady state over, uh, this plan represents 50 years, but it's really, you know, within the calculations, 100 years, but we just didn't extend that as far within the planning documentation, but um, that's the way it tracks um, so that then we can fund facilities and underground infrastructure um, at a stable rate. And so you can see here with this slide, this um, kind of reviews what was in the memo for the plan that was in your packet. These are the calculations and what goes into them. Um, generally, water and sewer are identical in terms of the amount invested. Um, and so just to kind of highlight the factors here. You know, it's 50 years uh, with inflation um, starting at $750,000 per year. Um, and so you can see that equates to 37.5 million or approximately 83.2 million when adjusted for 1.7% inflation plus 1% for variable economic conditions. Um, and so depending on where we go um, as we come out of the pandemic, you know, this inflationary rate may change. Um, we did take a look at the Northeast um, CPI indicator and did run an analysis to make sure that this 1.7% was holding true over the course of time and not just necessarily um, within the past year or so. Um, and we'll continue to keep an eye on things as um, we come out of the pandemic and things develop. Um, and so you can kind of see with the water distribution system, um, this replacement plan covers 52 miles. Um, and so we've got the, the math sort of there. And then with the sewer collection system, it's 44 miles plus the eight pump stations. Um, and so that's sort of what factors into this investment. Um, and so this is covered through a series of things, annual appropriation, it's covered by the rates um, and also um, by bonds um, and grants and you know any funding that we can get to secure um, the projects that we're doing for the infrastructure. And so just to go through you know what's included in the planning, um, this breakdown just kind of shows you on a timeline what we're doing currently. Um, in fiscal year 21 and 22, there is some money for water distribution capital improvements. Um, and then just kind of moving down on the line there, um, we are going to see some larger investments. And that's why I think it's critical that um, Finance and Public Works really took a look at this plan just to make sure that everything is kind of factored in as we know it to date. Um, and so this includes East State Street. This is a third of that funding. And so it's the total project cost is 5.25 and that's spread over the water fund, sewer fund, and general fund um, in terms of the, the various components of that project. Um, there's also um, some water meter replacements. And so the these would start in FY31 and it's split over two years and it would replace 
$2,783 meters at about $311 a piece. So that's there. Um, and then some of the pipeline improvements and um, infrastructure improvements are phased in. Um, so the first phase, phase here is just over 12 million and it expands from FY23 to FY47. Um, you can kind of see you know, what that includes, um, but it's just really focusing on providing the required minimum um, gallons per minute for fire flow protection. Um, and then also maintaining minimum PSI requirements throughout the water system. So that's the first piece. Second piece um, is to replace undersized water mains and um, serving fire hydrants. Um, and so we've got those indicated there and you can kind of see that, you know, when one ends, the other phase begins. And then also tracking through there, we've got some extra pipe work that's been booked. Um, and then additionally, we have some work that is being done in-house um, and we'll manage that um, as we come to it within the planning. And so moving on to the sewer portion of this plan, um, you've got a similar um, line item here for the East State Street improvements so that we can get shovel ready for FY23. This assumes that we'll do the work in 23, um, but as we get on, we'll you know assess where we get. But I wanted to make sure, and Public Works wanted to make sure that we included everything that's currently on the table in the plan. Um, and so we, we've got it captured here, and maybe the years may change, but we'll see what comes to pass. Um, I've got a line item here for the water resource recovery facility for phases one and two. Um, I don't have anything booked there because it is. Um, neutral in terms of its impact on the plan because of the revenue generation. Um, and so just noting that, um, and that will also come into play as we get into later slides and we start to talk about the impacts of these improvements on debt service. Um, and so much like the water plan, there's um, additional pipe um, replacement um, work that's going on here. Um, and then, um, we, so the, the phases just based on the timeline are kind of broken off a little bit here. So we've got a phase one and phase two, just like the water plan. So the first phase is um, sewer line improvements and to eliminate combined sewer overflows. And then the second phase, which is the larger of the two by far, uh, just um, under 44 million is to construct two sewer line improvements to re replace the clay tile lines. Um, and then additionally, much like with the water plan, there is DPW in-house work spread across the life of the plan. Um, and then noted here, phase two of the wastewater treatment facility, um, we're projecting to be roughly about 6.5 million. Um, and so we're working with that target in mind based on what we've heard from ESG and um, the discussions that have happened um, recently. And so this um, graph is um, really a visual of, you know, the work that we're doing and kind of how we're paying for it. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, as we're, we, we are trending up here, um, but it just kind of gives you a sense of what's happening and how it's happening. Um, so it's pretty interesting if that's um, the way, like, see information. And so getting on to some of the um, more policy related um, impacts of this plan, um, you know, especially now more than ever, it's really important to make sure that we're holding to policy when it comes to debt service. And so um, two key factors here in our debt service policy related to general fund and citywide um, debt expenditures um, are the general fund at 8.2% which is a threshold, and then the citywide, including um, governmental and business activities at 15%. And so with this work, we are um, getting to the cap on the 15% citywide with these two projects when you're just considering the debt to expenditure ratio. However, that is mitigated with um, the revenues that are coming in. And so we'll talk about that a little bit, but we also wanted to touch base and make sure that that's, you know, within reason and that um, council is okay with our approach. Um, and so you can see here on this graph in FY23, 
23 um, if we're looking at a purely expense um, side picture and not factoring in the revenues, we do bump up against the cap of 15% and ends up being 15.3%. Um, so it's close and then it comes back down because we are you know, making payments steadily. Um, but it's still something to note because the, you know, we've got the thresholds there to you know, really benchmark where we are. Um, but we've, we're also doing some pretty big things um, and we have a system that needs the upgrades. So just looking at the numbers here to highlight um, two columns in particular, these percentages columns, the percentage of GF revenue and then the overall city revenue, you can see on the general fund revenue side, we don't approach the 8.2% 8 8 threshold, but on the citywide revenue we do, but then you can see where it starts to come back down and it's highlighted cheated looks kind of purple on my screen, probably peach, but it's really the only color there. So that's, I just wanted to highlight that for you. But if we do factor in the um, water resource recovery revenue savings um, that have been projected to date, um, which with phases one and two comes to 876, 821. Um, for comparison in FY23, we would end up, if we took this out or netted it against it, we'd be at about 11.7%, which is still, you know, favorable and within range. And so I think given that there are um, revenues that are going against our debt or paying for the debt, and then some, hopefully, you know, we're in a good, pretty good position, but it's still really good to monitor where we are because we've got a lot coming down the line, um, especially as we've delayed projects and there's a lot of pent up demand um, and, you know, not only in water and sewer, but in streets and capital needs and, you know, other things. Um, so I just wanted to really highlight this for you so that you could see where we're at. Um, and so moving on, I also wanted to kind of pair this with our unrestricted fund balance perspective, um, because we just kind of, you know, the debt service is a big piece of um, expenditure, but then, you know, thinking about, you know, what we have for you know, money on hand at the end of the day. Um, and so we ran the fiscal year end 21 projections and there's a few caveats with each of these categories. Um, first, starting with the general fund, I think it's just um, important to note um, we're doing okay. Our um, deficit mitigation plan is working. However, you know, we are still limited in terms of you know, where we're at compared to policy to really be stable. So um, just reviewing this really quickly, general fund, we should be at about 15%, which is just over $2 million. And that does factor in deficit mitigation, taking down those um, expenditures that we you know, didn't end up spending. Um, and so with that, um, noting then where we're at for fund balance, we're at, projections. So again, these are projections. We'll see what comes to pass. It doesn't seem like it, but there's still um, some time left before the end of the fiscal year here. But um, this is our rough cut at this point. So um, 216,000 or so, um, almost 217. Um, and that does factor in, you know, the impact of the parking fund revenues that we're not seeing, um, and also local options tax revenues that we're not seeing. And so with the parking fund in particular, we're projecting that, you know, we'll be $305,000 down. Um, and so this is where we think we'll end up. So we'll end up to the good, um, but still considering on the whole, you know, we're not where we need to be in terms of the policy. And so, you know, from my perspective, it just seems like this would remain until we can continue to grow a little bit there so that we're, you know, tracking towards policy. Um, and then, as noted above in the unrestricted fund balance, we're looking at the enterprise funds for positive value. And in the water fund and sewer funds, they are positive um, in large part because in the water fund, based on COVID, you know, we really constrained any projects and, you know, really limited spending to only essential spending. So we weren't doing the projects that we had otherwise planned. Um, and so that's why we have a pretty healthy fund balance here. And then in the sewer fund, um, again, really healthy balance. However, 
you know, this is, um, we've taken in our pollution, pollution control grant as it relates to phase one of the uh, water resource recovery facility. And then USDA grant funding has come in too. And so this money really um, is there to kind of, you know, possibly fund phase two. Um, and so when you start to factor in phase two and the costs associated there um, and the necessary improvements related to the plan, it's um, healthy, but um, there are definitely demands on those funds. Um, so that's in summary where we are in terms of fund balance and doing okay. Um, you know, it's good to be on this end of things, but you know, especially in the general fund, it would be really nice to have a bigger unrestricted fund balance. Um, and so recommended action, um, you know, we'd like to review and revise this plan every three years so that then we can really stay current with what's happening in the city and to kind of, you know, make note of um, some of the benchmarks and make sure we're getting to where we need to go and to make sure that, you know, our debt service ratios are within range. Um, and just generally so that we can brief you on how we're doing, if we're meeting our mark, if we need to change things. Um, it just is a good opportunity, I think, to keep things current. Um, we'll continue to monitor um, progress when it comes to the water resource recovery facility in phase two, as well as East State Street. Um, and then as I mentioned, we'll work to continue to align um, debt service ratios within policy. And then our recommendation um, is to approve the plan as presented. And that's what I have. Hey, uh, questions or comments for Kelly? Uh, Lauren, good. Yeah, thanks. That was really helpful. Um, I guess just, just on my mind are like thinking of the, I get a decent number of questions about like the burst pipes and like thinking partially about like the climate resilience of this infrastructure. Like I, I, it, I anticipate and hope that we're like planning this out, knowing that we have a changing, you know, precipitation patterns and all of that. Like, I guess just curious how much that's being factored in at this point um, so that we feel like we're not gonna, you know, we'll get the full lifespan that we're anticipating and projecting and that all of these costs are based on um, and not gonna see kind of shortened lifespans because the um, materials or the size that they're designed or whatever don't um, work in the new kind of um, climate that we're going to be living in. So just, and I don't, I see Kurt or... <laughs> Kurt is on. I, I Kurt is on. I'm probably going to hand this one off to him um, because he is definitely <laughs> the subject matter expert when it comes to what's going in the ground. Um, I'll take the finance questions, but here you go, Kurt. <laughs> Sure. Um, so, you know, all these, all the infrastructure is underground. So, um, you know, it's not directly impacted by like rain. Uh, it's more of the storm system would be for that. Um, so, uh, you know, the water plant is probably the, the biggest um, infrastructure piece that would be impacted by uh, the amount of rain just because of um, the available capacity, you know, the, the pond levels. But we've actually seen an increase in that. You know, there was the the rates were actually set up um, for conservation, where the more you use, the more you pay. Um, and back when that was established, it was really a lot tighter. Uh, you know, it was drier back then. So we've seen kind of the reverse. Um, so you know, at some point, we may want to think about that rate structure as it relates to that. As far as pipe materials, um, the uh, water system. Uh, we did a lot of research uh, on pipe materials and. Uh, landed on HDPE as the most uh, uh, longest lasting pipe available. And it also um, can take the pressure surges that the city has. We have the highest pressure probably in all of the state, uh, if not New England. Um, <clears throat> but this pipe can actually expand and contract with uh, pressure changes. So uh, I think it is the most resilient option available, longest life uh, pipe system. And we also have a consultant that has a hydraulic model um, that models the water system and um, they we hire them to size uh, every new pipe project pretty much um, unless it's a very you know small neighborhood 
where you just go eight inch. Um, so we do, and that factors in, you know, uh, future growth and fire demands. Generally, we size off, um, off from uh, um, insurance rate requirements, so you can get the maximum fire flow capacity, which is more than adequate for domestic demands. So that answers your questions. Thanks, One of the things that I uh, am wondering about from following that presentation is um, looking through the projects that are listed there. Um, it's not, it wasn't totally clear to me if those projects were in addition to the annual number of feet replacement um, or if that was a part of, if, if that, if the feet replacement per year benchmark was um, being accounted for by those projects. Does that question make sense? <clears throat> um, you know, like with the, with the $12 million for the phase one for the, um, the sewer, uh, sorry, the water line to make sure that we have enough pressure for hydrants. Uh, you know, we've got this quota that ideally we're, we're meeting and maybe sometimes it's less or sometimes it's more, but um, wasn't clear to me how those two things played into each other. Well, if you're referring to like uh, East Street, um, that that would be included in the total footage um, targets for was, pipe replacement. Or are you referring to the plant? Um, referring so that one was like 23, 20 or FY23. Uh, or something like that. Uh, but this one was the next one down. There was a $12 million line and maybe it was over multiple years. Um, but that I get like, it just wasn't clear if, because presumably that's replacing line, right? Like that's, uh, we're replacing some amount of water line with a, with a bigger pipe. So I assume that that would be counting towards our, our goal, um, the, yes. you know, line replacement for the year. Um, it does. Okay. And also, if you if within your packet there is a and within the plan there's a pipe replacement schedule table that kind of shows, you know, when we're replacing pipes and that's factored into the plan at large and kind of the and um, so that that does give you sort of a sense of of when we're doing that. Um, things so, start to really ramp up after FY twenty seven. Um, that is at least as a part of this agenda item that is not included in the pack. There's only one page um, included with this item. Okay, um, well, I am happy to share um, the memo and um, the additional um, pieces with the plan. Um, and what what is shown there is kind of what I think you're trying to drive at is that, you know, are the component pieces um, all part of the same or, you know, are, are the pipes separate from the projects? And it right. I think it depends, you know, like Kurt was saying with the East Jade Street, that would be, you know, part of, um, you know, that calculation. Um, I can say that we also did, you know, run sort of a, a rough calc on, well, not really rough, but what we've done so far, um, just to make sure that we were tracking. And while, you know, we may be down a little bit over the pandemic, over the life of the plan, we are, you know, within range to meeting targets. And so I don't know if I'm answering the question fully, um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the, the total picture. Um, so, so I, um, that, that all sounds fine in part, I hate to say this, um, in part knowing that there is information that maybe we should have had that we don't have uh, like it's actually something that I'm uh, that I'm interested in and would like to see and, and so I'm wondering if um, if you need an approval on this tonight or if if you could give us another um, you know to the next meeting to no I'm, I'm happy to make sure you've got all the information um, and you know we can certainly you know, talk about it at the next meeting. Um, really, the intent was just to sort of update our plans so that sure. then, you know, everything was factored in. Um, these with the 2016 plan, we didn't 
fully capture the um, water resource recovery um, updates. Yeah, I like as as your presentation was going, I was like trying to absorb all all of those numbers as we were yeah, going. Yeah, that's um, kind of a kind of a lot. If you don't have the memo, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. I assume <laughs> okay. you have that. Um, no, no and worries. so let me. Um, I'll send it right over, and then yes. you know we can kind of. Maybe that's just a quick summary and then um, you can let me know what you think um, or what questions you have so that we can, you know, drill down into details if you'd like. Um, I don't think you need to do another presentation. I, other thoughts? I mean, if you if the rest of the council is happy to, to move forward, then that's fine. I'm just, um, you know, putting that out there. Other, other thoughts? I got one question from the public. I'll get, yep, thank you, Steve. Hold on for one second. Just wanted to check in with the council um, about, uh, how do you feel about uh, waiting until next time to, to vote on this? Jack, go ahead. I thought it was a very good presentation, but I think for us to be uh, satisfied that we're seeing the information we need and answering the questions we need to answer, I really would feel better uh, to do it, do your, follow your suggestion of putting off till next week. Okay. Other um, thoughts from council on this? Does anybody prefer to, to take it up tonight? Okay. All right, uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, do, do these prices uh, account for the, the time shift of emergency breakages that which seems to keep throwing our our calendar off, and do they include the costs of repair, re restoring the streets and sidewalks as we do this work, or are those entirely, you know, bigger numbers on top of the? Is this just pipes and holes, you know? That's a good, good question. But um, the footage price includes uh, pavement restoration, um, and, you know, the whole cost, the service lines, hydrants, everything is factored in when we develop those per, those costs per foot of utility replacements. Uh, as far as repairs for water breaks, uh, those are included in the operating budget. Um, you know, we did just complete a rebuild of the finished water pumps at the plant. Um, which seems to have smoothed out some of the pressures and uh, knock on wood, but it seems like our water leaks uh, in the last couple months since that project has have dropped off. So that's good news. Um, but yeah, that <clears throat> when we do the bigger projects like East State Street, it's split between the funds. Uh, when we do st complete street re rehabilitation, there's some general fund money that goes into uh, the, the stabilization fabric and the storm system and things like that. If it's strictly a utility project, then the utility covers all the pavement patching um, work with the project. Um, Jack, go ahead. Kurt, when you say knock on wood, you're not talking about any of the uh, water lines, are you? <clears throat> there's <laughs> there's a few water <laughs> wooden water lines in the ground, but they are no longer in service. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just to um, follow up on that too. Um, so, so there's, uh, I assume, I mean, maybe this is something I can dig into once you send over on um, the details, but, uh, I'm assuming that there's a, a water replacement, uh, or I guess an emergency, uh, replacement line. And, uh, I'm curious how that, um, has been budgeted as compared to actuals. Um, and it's, it sounds like, you know, we're hoping that it's less because we've done these repairs to the, to the pumps. Um, but yeah, any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, well, the emergency repairs that are in the operating budget, um, so that's kind of built in outside of these capital improvement projects. Oh, it's rare okay. for us to replace a, an entire line in an emergency situation. It has happened. It happened on Ridge Street when um, it washed out the road uh, twice in a matter of five years. So we did um, find money to replace that section kind of on this, as an emergency project. Um, but that's a rare instance. Otherwise, it's um, it's captured in the operating budget, sort of separate from these numbers in the presentation. Okay. As part Thank of the you. rate that you just approved. Right, right, yeah. Um, other thoughts? 
Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you, Kelly and Kurt. Again, <laughs> thanks for all your work on this. And we'll um, take this up again next time, if that is okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So, um, all right. So now we are up to um, the discussion of public restrooms. And uh, for this, I think it's, is it either Bill or Cameron? Uh, well, I, it can be either of us. Is actually, this was requested to be on the agenda by Council Member Richardson uh, at the last meeting. And um, I think we do have some information about just the inventory of what's there, what isn't. But I also would defer to the Council Member who may um, have his own thoughts as to what he'd like to discuss. Yeah, go ahead, Dan, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, what we were hoping to talk about last time or what I was hoping to talk about is, you know, we've had talk about um, adding permanent public restrooms. Um, and I think that, you know, this was born a little bit out of the fact that, you know, we have potentially money coming from the federal government or the state um, that would be well suited for this. And we should probably get serious about where, what it would look like, design, thoughts, um, you know, sort of forwarding it. And, and it seemed like, I, I, I mean, my hope would be um, like a working group or committee that would be starting to, starting to do that. And I, you know, I know, I appreciate that Cameron put together uh, the sort of George Costanza list of available public restrooms uh, in the city of Montpelier. Um, so, you know, I think that's a great way to, that's, that might be a great way to start um, talking about this. But then, you know, what I, what I'd ask is whether we're ready to, to create a, a committee to talk about this you know what what type of what restroom facilities i mean i know when steve whitaker's weighed in on this you know he wants or he's urged us to have showers and uh facilities um and you know at the same time i i you know i think location is key and you know just understanding what what would it mean to add uh, a public restroom like a year and should it be year round should it be 24 7 or should it be you know, uh, or are we talking about multiple places? Um, so I think it's a good conversation that we should be having. Um, and maybe not us as a council, but a group that could sort of look around because, you know, the other part of this is that there's been a number of cities, Burlington, Portland, Oregon, Tokyo, you know, uh, other communities that have <clears throat> adopted public restrooms of different types and different designs and different uses and different functions. And we should, uh, I'd really like to have a group take a look at it and be able to come back with us to us with recommendations. That's how I'd start it. Sure, uh, Connor, go ahead. Uh, well, we had we had a good chat about this today at the homelessness task force, and um, you know, first want to want to give a big shout out to Cameron because uh, it, it's pretty clear uh, she she's moving mountains to get where we are. You know, I think we're thinking long term, but. No, just, just saying today, she's, we're almost running out of uh, handicapped ac accessible porta johns there uh, because she's on the phone to them all the time trying to get them there. Um, so I think city staff should be c commended for doing what we can in the short term. But, you know, I, I think we need to be, as Dan said, you know, we need to be thinking long term here. And, um, you know, there's, there's other models. We actually heard a really good presentation a couple of weeks ago. Uh, from the facilities director at Montpelier High School. He's a teacher down at, um, at, at Norwich, um, where he, he, he tasked his class with designing day shelters that might go broader than bathrooms and you know, incorporate lockers, um, you know, shower facilities. So that might be a bit aspirational, but it would be nice to get a few, few plans like this on the table if a location uh, you know, popped up and you know, if we did have the money, like some of this federal money, if we were eligible to spend it that way. Um, so I really like that idea. And I, I've said it a few times. I, I really do believe there should be a shared responsibility uh, between the state and the city, because, you know, we're, we're not just talking about people experiencing homelessness. Um, we have thousands and thousands of visitors to our state capital every year. 
And, uh, you know, I, I spoke to a few legislators this year about it. I don't think it was the year to do it. Uh, but to get, get an appropriation in the capital bill, I don't think should be far-fetched. And I don't think we should be shy asking. Um, so maybe linking up with some of our legislators as part of this task force. And, um, you know, I'd love to see the makeup be, you know, maybe a couple of counselors, a couple of homelessness task force reps. Um, and I, I, I do know Ken's here who could probably maybe sum up some of the discussion better than myself here, but uh, totally, totally support moving forward with this. Uh, yeah, no, that was, I mean, well said, Connor. And um, yeah, that, that presentation by is Vermont Technical College uh, professor. Um, it, and it, it would like helpful to imagine what the city would look like if we took all the needs of the folks on the streets seriously. Um, citing something and paying for it is, is a different issue, obviously. Um, but it'd be nice to, you know, it'd be great for all of you to see the, this, pre you know, we good to have you see this presentation. Um, obviously, you know, folks are coming out now and we're going to get a wave of folks in a couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, kudos to Cameron for getting these basic needs met for folks for just basics for helping to get some money for some of that. Um, and yeah, we want, you know, it'd be fantastic if you all could make the permanent bathrooms that are 24 seven except inaccessible, that'd be fantastic. Um, and, you know, and the inventory of existing facilities for people's basic needs is, is very helpful as well. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating because some of these things that seem fairly simple and straightforward, you know, we run into to red tape and different issues, even like charging stations or, or lockers. But, but this just kudos to making, you know, moving forward with this. And I know we're all frustrated. We can't just wave a magic wand and make it happen tomorrow sometimes. So, yeah, but I, I very supportive. And I know Don Little is here as well. So. Um, Jack, you had a hand up. Sorry, Thanks. sorry if I cut in there. Oh, it was per perfect timing for you to do that, Ken. Thanks. Um, yeah. I, I agree with everything that uh, Dan and Connor said. I think we are, I think we should move this on our agenda from something that we think uh, it would be nice to have to something that uh, we really need. And I hope uh, people recognize that. And I really appreciate Dan putting this on our agenda in the first place a, a year or two ago and continuing to push it. I think it's uh, it really is a need. It's not just uh, something that we would like to have. Um, on, the, uh, on the short term, so I think that what we should be doing is planning for how and where we can do it, um, not whether. Um, on the short term uh, perspective, one of the things that I think that the uh, handout from Cameron is, is very, very good and useful. And one of the things that uh, is stuck in my mind that I don't remember if we actually made a decision or uh, came to a resolution of how this would work, but I recall that there was a time when we were talking about what we could do to make the uh, public bathrooms downstairs in, uh, in the lower level of City Hall open uh, at night. And I know that there are building security issues there. I know we had uh, some discussions of that at our meetings and I'm, uh, I'm not sure where, where that stands, but I think that is something else that I'd like to see on the agenda because it's something that could be done more quickly than uh, building a permanent structure. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, I think it's part of this committee work, Jack, uh, to look at that, because I think I would like us to really look holistically as Connor brought up of the building of the other possibilities and get a model in mind and that we find the money and we do it. It's, it's really important and it's got to be more holistic than just toilets. 
I think we really have to look at the whole problem that we now face with people who don't have a place to put their head at night, don't have a place to shower. So I would love to see a committee and I'll be glad to make the motion that we create a committee. <laughs> I think we need to move forward very seriously on it. Yeah, I agree. We've been talking about this for a while. I think it's it's um, worth having some uh, minds dedicated to it. I need a second. I'll second. Oh, or that, oh, sorry, that was a motion. Okay. <laughs> All right, so a motion and a second. Um, this is a, a committee. What, what do you want the name of this to be, Donna? Oh. Some wordsmith in the group, something creative and inspiring. What are we calling this? Public restroom committee? Words of the loop. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron gets credit for that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> while you're thinking of a name, I guess I, I, I'm, so first of all, I think it's great that we're doing this. Um, and this may be more for the committee than for the council, but um, part of, part of what, you know, using the old begin with the end in mind uh, as we think about this, are we looking, you know, are, I think it's a question, are you looking for something for evening use, for overnight, is this something for the unhoused population or is this, you know, daytime tourist visitors or we're trying to serve both? Uh, so where are the location, you know, I think it's it, thinking about who the, who the end user is before we just start saying, hey, here's a great place to put a bathroom because it might be a great place for some use but not for others. So uh, I think that's probably not your job. I think that's the committee's job, but I would yeah. just say that be that be in whatever directions you give the committee is first identify. And it, it may, you may end up with like a daytime restroom option and list of options, you know, as the state's reopening, their bathrooms are gonna be getting reopened. Um, so, you know, daytime will have more options as going forward like we used to, but, you know, are we looking for evening? And, and given the widespread area that people occupy at night, you know, are, are we thinking we're going to create one place for someone to go in the middle of the night? And I, that's probably going to be difficult, but I'd leave that to the committee to work out. Madam Mayor, if you public comment when you're ready. Um, sure, go ahead, Steve. Uh, I, this is an issue that, as you know, I've been raising for several years. Um, there is both the long-term architectural and strategic locations for to accommodate uh, residents and tourists, as well as the unhoused, but there's also the impending uh, emergency or the existent and about to increase emergency. Uh, you, you need to, I would advise that you create this committee with uh, an immediate uh, charge, not leave them to develop a charge to come back for approval in a month. You, it, is it more urgent than that? Um, consideration of uh, can't be, with the emergency consideration can't be separated from the, uh, whether or not we're gonna allow designated camping because w where you could put a toilet trailer or a shower trailer, those, there's a lead time, there's a uh, maybe even a backlog. Those are tens of thousands of dollars each. Uh, and those are reusable, you know, like in a FEMA type motor pool uh, as a statewide resource. But, you know, the, the, there's, I'm, what I'm trying to do is emphasize that there's emergency considerations that need to be made that can be Need, need to be happening sooner than the uh, architectural designations. The, I disagree that uh, months ago you approved and you took Bill's word for there's no room to negotiate anything more out of the transit center. The transit center has excellent bathrooms. It's a grossly underutilized building. They're open to having the city uh, either extend the hours of that staff or people in the building staff it or city hire somebody to staff it and keep that open longer term. There's even room for lockers there, even on an interim basis until a vendor goes in, but the vendor doesn't look like they're coming in to sell coffee anytime soon. So 
you, you may need to make some emergency provisions, and I, I, I just encourage you to get that framework in mind while we simultaneously start looking at architectural uh, and existing options. But the city hall, it, the city center, probably not so much anymore, uh, and the <laughs> transit center are, are our best options. Just want to clarify a point that was just made. Um, when I said there was no more negotiation, I said, and I said this at the time, that, that uh, GMT had no more funds to expand ours. But if the city wanted to pay, they were willing to have us do that. And we looked at the cost. So that is an option that we could very, you know, we could do that. He's correct, but he's not correct that I said we couldn't do it. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm reaching the end of my patience with his mis, uh, representing my statements uh, in public. Um, I've also talked to BGS about, uh, as I mentioned, they're reopening their, um, their buildings. Um, I've also talked to them. The original model for the transit center was that the, um, welcome center, the, the BGS welcome center was going to be co-located there. And so the state employees would actually be staffing it. It would be a combination welcome center. People could get the bus there. Obviously, GMT would have to provide some technical assistance. And I've reopened that conversation with the state because that would provide um, perhaps more operating hours and, and save GMT some costs. So to the extent that the state is interested in uh, supporting transit, as well as having a, a welcome center located right where people are coming into town. So that is a, a current conversation that's happening. Um, so far, they've said, sounds interesting, we'll talk about it, they haven't made any commitments, but um, we are not simply ignoring the transit center as an option. Thank you. Um, uh, if it needs, Maybe. my motion needs to be more clear, I guess for now, I guess I would see that we, I would like to see this committee be very holistic in its view of looking at our current need or what I call public washrooms, as well as toilets. And that they look at the list such as what Cameron's done for us and how do we expand hours? There might be ideas, lots of ideas. I don't wanna get into them tonight, but I'd like the committee to really be very broad and holistic in their approach. And there may be several different solutions that feed into, or several different components that feed into the ultimate solution to serve people who are homeless as tourists mothers with little kids, whatever. There's a, there's a holistic need here because the porty pods keep disappearing. The state took theirs away <laughs> this week. I was very disappointed to see them gone uh, at one point. So that was my intention of the motion. Yeah, and the state actually took theirs away because their buildings are reopening and their bathrooms will be available. That's why they took them away. So they did not need external porta potties anymore. They, they really do, but it's another story. Okay, um, and so there were a couple of seconds. Um, is th that clarity uh, amenable to, I think it was Jack and Dan. <laughs> I'm not sure who's the second of record, so. <laughs> Jack can have it. Jack. Yeah, it, it's not totally fine with me. Okay. Uh, and Donna, did you or anyone else have thoughts on the name for this? Okay. Public, uh, do you want to? I added the word public washrooms as well as toilets, restrooms. Public washrooms and toilets, Jack, yeah. And I had someone suggest to me online public facilities to suggest that it's broader than just bathrooms, but of yeah. course that also Perfect. means it doesn't, facilities can mean every public building in the city, which is uh, maybe a little too broad, but. Uh, Public facilities, beautiful. The committee may come up with something very clever. Uh, John. Yeah, just for clarification, um, I started following that description for a while, but is the entirety of your description then part of the motion? Because I mean, I can go back and listen and reconstruct it, that's fine. I just want to be sure. I, I understood that was just. Sorry, go ahead. The intention of my extra wording was I didn't want it to be seen very narrow. I wanted the charge to be broad about public facilities that will meet our need. 
No, I, I understand that. It's just that I didn't know if that entire description was then part of the motion. No, no. It's part of our consciousness. Okay. That that seems fair. Just yeah, it doesn't need to be a part of the motion as long as it's clear to the whoever is on the committee. Thanks for and clarifying, who, John. Who are you thinking are committee members? Is this a council subcommittee? Is this members of the public? Is this members of the business community? The city staff? Like, what, what were you thinking of as the makeup of the committee? I guess I heard a suggestion of a couple of council members, a couple of individuals from the homeless task force. Anyone else, Connor? Dan, I missed. Well, I mean, I think general public, I mean, if somebody wants to join this, um, it strikes me that, you know, there's a couple of different architects in town and um, it would be really wonderful if, if someone like that was willing to serve. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see maybe a couple, maybe one, one or two counselors, whoever wants to be on it and, and homeless, uh, someone, you know, at least one person from the homelessness task force, but I think it should be a small committee. I mean, I would suggest five. Um, well, anybody can bring in resources. So by all means, um, if we say two council members, two people from the homeless task force and one general public, but I don't, I don't, I guess I don't want us to wait and go searching that we, we start and people join in because um, it does need to be done. To get the ball moving. I, I like that makeup. Um, you know, I, I, I think nothing precludes other people from joining the committee if you just have the core five that are the ones voting on it, right? It's I think you might want to, if you're going to have two people from the homelessness task force and two people from the council, you might want to have someone from Montpelier Alive or someone representing the downtown community because that is certainly a need for many of the businesses uh, during, you know, they they have people, but also I think they may, you know, they have their own concerns about congregation of people. And so that's a voice that should be heard, uh, not necessarily kowtowed to, but it ought to be at the table. So whether we just ask Montpelier Alive to, to find a rep, um, whoever they, they can round up. It's a good idea. It's great. Then if there are two members of the public, then that would bring us to an odd number, which I think would be good. <clears throat> um, Madam Chair, I, okay. uh, can I, can, yeah, can I just call yeah, can I caution that this uh, looks uh, has all the specter of the uh, two years of non-action uh, on any of the goals of the homelessness task force. So if you put, you know, the vested interest in the status quo, that's what you're going to get out of it, you know? So I would just disagree that we've maintained the status quo. I feel like we've made progress with the homeless task force and um, it may not be all like have achieved all of the goals that we hope to achieve, but we've, we've done, we've done some things and like, I, I'm glad that we've, um, formed that committee. In any case, um, uh, yeah, this group is going to have a, have a clear mission and a really specific, uh, well, well defined goal. Uh, and I, I hope that they're able to, um, come back to us in a timely way. Um, yeah, so, uh, having said that, um, so we have a general idea of the makeup. I think we have a clear mission for this group and, uh, <laughs> maybe we don't, I don't know if we have clarity about the name public. I feel like it's like public facilities is actually too broad. Um, but like public bathroom facilities, maybe, uh, or pub or What's wrong with restrooms, restrooms okay. kind of covers it all. No, restrooms could have hand washing things, public yeah. restrooms. Sure. Is that <laughs> Donna doesn't like it works. It. Is it, is that okay with you, Donna? Yeah, fine. Fine. Okay. I just think that's such, that's such a terrible term. It just, anyway, restrooms? yes. <laughs> the, the water closet committee. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, any further discussion on this? 
Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes. So um, I assume this is something that Mary will be posting, will advertise for, and then hopefully be able to um, point folks to at the, I'm not sure what our timing is. It's either the next meeting or the meeting after. Um, so but we'll, we'll get on it. It's great. Thanks everybody. Thanks Dan for, for bringing this up to as a, its own agenda item. <laughs> Super. All right. Uh, so we are going to move on here. Um, and all right. So, oh, here. So at the end of the last meeting, everyone's internet simultaneously uh, disintegrated. And it was very exciting. But it meant that we, I'm not sure that we were very clear about which summertime meeting we were canceling. Um, so we wanted to put it on this agenda to just confirm, assuming that everyone's internet was working now. Um, yeah, so we were on the cusp of agreeing on J July 7, but we didn't, then everybody just went out. So how do people feel about canceling July 7? And move okay. we cancel the July 7th meeting? I'll second. Further discussion? I feel like that one didn't work well for Dan. Is that is that accurate? Well, I mean, so I'm going to be on a I may be on a plane next week uh, when we have this meeting. So, uh, but the, I think we discussed this before. So I, I think I'm the only one affected, um, and uh, I, I'm willing to uh, grant your repeat reprieve from my presence next week. So. Um, <laughs> We can take the seventh off as well. I'm happy to do that. Okay. All right. Um, fair enough. Uh, there was a motion. Uh, was there a second? I think there was a second. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Uh, all right. So that passes. So we will be canceling our July 7th meeting. This was going to take a second and take it out of my calendar right now. Okay. All right. So that um, brings us up to council reports. Uh, Donna, are you up for going first? I'm going to pass. <clears throat> we'll get out early. Okay. Uh, all right, Connor. Well, definitely have to express disappointment in the governor's veto of our charter change. And uh, you know, if you know anybody in the legislature, uh, give them a ring and please override in a couple of weeks there. That'd be a beautiful thing. Um, also, I want to thank, uh, thank the state's attorney, uh, Rory Tebow. He wrote a pretty stern letter to the uh, Assistant Secretary of Human Services. I, I don't know if you folks saw that. Uh, just on the state not really having a comprehensive plan. Uh, for when the hotel vouchers dry up on uh, July 1st there. So, uh, yeah, really, really appreciate Rory, uh, you know, stepping up and, you know, in his role, applying some pressure there. So that's it for me. Great. Jay. Uh, I'll keep mine. Uh, I'll keep a theme for my two quick comments, which is uh, school related. One is, uh, um, uh, congratulating both the girls tennis team and the boys lacrosse team at Montpelier High School who won state championships tonight um, and good luck to uh, the, the girls ultimate team tomorrow night on their on their finals uh, but also I think uh, probably broader and more significant is acknowledging the work of um, administrators faculty staff uh, and particularly the students of all of the Montpelier Roxbury schools getting through what was an incredibly challenging year um, and being able to, um, uh, to, to be able to stay in school and stay, um, you know, really committed to, uh, to, their, to their community. And I think that that is really showing through the elementary schools, graduation tonight, middle school tomorrow night, the high school on Friday night. I just think it's a, uh, um, worth pointing out the, the effort as a that was made as a community to um, 
make sure the kids have the experience that they did throughout the school year. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Dan. Uh, I'm actually going to take a pass tonight. Thank you. Jack. Well, I thought I had three things, but when I got to writing down, I could only think of two of them. So um, sorry about that. But one of them was, uh, as with uh, Jay, I know Friday is the last day of school. And I also want to give thanks to the teachers, the administrator, to the mayor, and all the teachers in the schools, the administrators. Uh, I know my granddaughter loves her teacher. And I think that our schools did a great job, you know, did everything they could to make this a successful year under the worst possible circumstances. And I really recognize and praise them for that. Um, the second item is also a school related. Uh, people on the council and people in the public may remember that a couple of years ago, the uh, school board created a a committee to uh, look at uh, Main Street Middle School possible uses and uh, of the building and what else could be done for uh, for the middle school. I was appointed to uh, be a city council representative on that committee, and as it happens, Jay and Dan were also appointed to that committee and have since also become council members. So, uh, so we really have. Uh, a lot of muscle on that com committee, although we haven't, the committee hasn't met in a little over a year and we just received notice uh, last week from the school board that they decided to uh, terminate that committee and they're going to be doing other things to, uh, to look at the uh, physical uh, plant needs for the, uh, for the school system. Um, I do think that uh, among the members of the, of the community uh, who were on the committee and we had a we had faculty representation we had uh, administration representation we had student representation and uh, uh, <clears throat> neighbor and community representation it was uh, it was quite productive during the time we were working and uh, even though we we're terminated without a final project I don't uh, I don't think it, it, the time we spent was wasted in doing it. And that's all I've got for tonight. Uh, thanks, uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks, just one thing. Um, so Jack and I are serving on the um, police review committee and we had set as a council a June 30th deadline for a report from that group and they have been working very diligently. We're now on weekly meetings and working very hard, doing a lot of uh, analysis and um, outreach and all kinds of things. And it's looking like we're more on probably an August timeline and just wanted to check in with the council to see, since we had set a June 30th, um, see if that was okay with you all. Um, we definitely wanted to get it in before we're really into budget season. Um, so just wanted to put it out to you all to make sure that that was okay. We, um, the committee basically said we could give a, a truncated and less thoughtful report by June 30th, if that's what the council prefers, um, the committee's willing to and interested in taking that extra month, month and a half to, um, kind of deliver a better and more vetted report. Um, so hopefully that's okay and just wanted to kind of make sure that that worked for council um, and I can take back the whatever reaction Jack and I can to, to the committee. Does that, yeah. does that sound okay to people? Yeah, that's fine. I'd rather have something more thoughtful than less thoughtful, uh, even if it means more time. So great. I will share that with the committee and that's it for me tonight. Thanks. Okay. Uh, all right, so I have uh, one item. Uh, I had forwarded to the council a letter that uh, came to me from Ken Russell uh, asking, the, the original version of it uh, asked for the governor to delay uh, 
lifting the emergency or the, the state of emergency because there were um, funds tied to that for uh, you know keeping folks housed in the current system. And uh, so and when whenever that uh, emergency order is lifted, uh, that uh, those housing vouchers basically go away. Um, and so the request was to delay lifting the order. I, I told him, well, basically he wanted to know if he thought, you know, we would be on board for something like that. I, I told him, while we probably wouldn't be on board for lifting, for delaying lifting the emergency order, or I'm sorry, delaying lifting the state of emergency, uh, we might be potentially, I, you know, I, I didn't speak with anybody about this beforehand, but just guessing in here anyway, that it might be more interesting to um, encourage the governor to keep uh, funding in place for uh, these housing vouchers uh, so that people are not, you know, immediately homeless by the time um, the state of emergency is, is done. Um, so the, the letter that I forwarded to you uh, says, uh, you know, we're reaching out to you to request that you delay fully lifting the state of emergency order to ensure that uh, the continued safety of vulnerable Vermonters until more complete plans are in place to expand state support for access to healthy food and safe housing. Um, one possibility is that uh, if we can all get behind that, great. If not, um, you know, would we want to encourage staff to write a letter on behalf, on our behalf, um, asking the governor to um, maintain funding for homeless services um, or, the, or this program <laughs> that's keeping folks in in hotels um, or housing housing folks in hotels for now uh, or I the alternatively I, I can come up with something on my own as, as mayor and just sign it on my own behalf and any of those is fine um, thoughts about about any of that yeah go ahead Connor. I'm, I'm happy with what you drafted, to be honest. I, I think it's direct. I think it actually might be uh, more meaningful coming from the, the, the city, you know, than just yeah. signing on to a bigger letter there. Uh, and it's more clear with what we want. So, uh, yeah, I support it. Do you need a motion, Anne, or just support from us? Um, you know, a motion wouldn't hurt. Um, you made the motion. I'll second it. I'll move it. <laughs> All right, so Connor's moving that we sign this letter. Uh, Donna, you're seconding, is that right? Okay, um, any further discussion on this? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, great, thank you. Um, I didn't see any municipalities uh, had signed on to this letter yet, so I mean, it may be the first, and I, I think it's a, a worthwhile thing to ask for. Uh, all right, I that is it for me. Uh, so, John. Uh, nothing but to say that I am neither going to Mo Moldova nor Bulgaria. And other than that, um, y'all should listen to my podcast. I have a podcast now. Everybody go see my podcast. That's it. Fair <laughs> enough. Thank you. Uh, Bill. Um, so I don't have a lot, just I think you've already referred to this, uh, so that next week we have a, a meeting, so we don't normally have them back to back, and then we won't be meeting until the end of July, so that schedule will be out. I did want to talk, you know, we've had a couple of references tonight to uh, the ARPA money, and I wanted to address something just to put you on alert, um, and I hope it will be rectified and we, it'll just be a little blip but I think it's important for everybody to know when funding as you know the, the funding established by Congress went to cities and towns counties and states and then many other parts of the count, country counties are a very important part key part of the governmental structure and not so much in New England uh, and in the Northeast but particularly New England and so when the bills and the final things were established it, it arranged for 
um, counties, the county money to be distributed straight to cities and towns, except they missed Vermont. Um, so the so all of the money we've been quoted in terms of what we're going to get was assuming county money was redistributed to cities and towns. What the legislature approved was that the counties would get the money and return it to the state and the state would then decide what to do with it. Um, now, presumably, they would decide to give it to the cities and towns who have all been counting on it. Um, and I, I have been in touch with the League of Cities and Towns. They've talked to the governor. They've talked to our congressional delegation, all of whom are advocating very hard that this money goes straight to cities and towns. But just so you understand, for us, it's a difference of a total over the two years of, of 2.1 and a half million to 771,000. So it's about two thirds of the total is this county money. So again, hopefully it won't be a problem. We're certainly going to jump all over. I, I would recommend, and I assume you'll all agree, that we contact our legislative delegation immediately and point this out to them and urge them to support this money going to the cities and towns for whom it was intended in the first place. Um, but there, if, if the Treasury doesn't change its guidance on this, um, in theory, the state can take this and do whatever it wants with it. So. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously all the plans, all the funding we've talked about, um, might require a rethink. I don't want to, you know, I think in the end it'll get straightened out because Congress was clear, but it, it's not a guarantee. So I felt you ought to know about it and know that we're already chasing it down. Uh, it's obviously substantial and makes a huge difference on what we would be able to do with those funds. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to, again, thank you all for allowing me to serve as a regional vice president for ICMA. We had our first in-person meeting um, since I've been on. It's all been all virtual instead this past weekend, and it was a real honor to represent our city and our state and our region um, with the 20 other people who represent the rest of the world. Um, so, uh, and it was interesting business talk for the organization and the profession and um, all of that. So, um, thank you letting me surf and that's all i have cameron okay. do you have anything else i don't right now um thank you for asking i will sort of volunteer myself to help out with the public restroom committee um it's something that uh, obviously i'm very close to uh, in the work that i do with the other committees and would like to continue that if that's all right it's great. great. Thank, Thank you. you. That's excellent. Uh, all right. So we have uh, one other item, which is um, a hotel garage update. Um, uh, Jay, yeah. Thanks. One quick question. Um, yeah. Seeing as our next scheduled uh, meeting is on the 16th, um, the day after the um, mass mandate ends, are we assuming that uh, it will be still be by Zoom or uh, what's the possibility of being back in chambers? That's a good question. So the, the reopening plan, so you guys can do what you want. The reopening plan that you approved called us, called for us to start in-person meetings after July 6th. Right. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't know if maybe that. Uh, you can, I mean, that was your plan. Oh, uh, Lauren. Um, just noting, I was planning to zoom in from Connecticut, so <laughs> I, I could do that even if some of you were in person. I guess if we had figured that technology out, but so right, really, we, we, we still do have the city council chambers open for for folks who need to use it. We're going to try to keep this hybrid model open for this month, and then throughout uh, when you meet in person, try to get that. To be part of our council meetings going forward. Yeah. So uh, we would basically at most have one more meeting by Zoom, even if things are um, lifted. So I, I I feel okay about sticking with that plan for now. Um, thinking about the next meeting as sort of our our last 
Zoom meeting and having it be kind of a, a transitional time, I guess, thinking about, okay, we're ready to go back. Um, so is that okay with you? Or I uh, was gonna check in, is that, that okay with you, Jay? I mean, oh, it's a good absolutely. question. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I just okay. wanted to put it out there um, just with as quickly or not as quickly, but as things are changing and evolving. So I just wanted to yeah. ask. Yeah, it's fair. It's a good question. And Jack, did you have something? Yeah, I, I think it's consistent with the overall plan of uh, reopening city buildings to the public on July 6th. And so, okay. yep. Um, much as I really want to get back in the same room with all of you. I think we can make it one more meeting. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So for this next item, um, we have a, an update to receive and uh, anticipating that we may want to do this in executive session. Jack. I move pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A1 that we make a finding that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the city of Montpelier in uh, at a substantial disadvantage in pending civil litigation to which the city is a party. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Uh, Jack. I move that we go into executive session and that we not return to public section session at the conclusion of the executive session. I think we might have to. Is that yeah. to, in order to adjourn? Okay. okay, take that last part out of this uh, the motion. We go back without any plans to do anything, no. Right. 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 Yeah. I'll second. Um, okay, motion and a second. And just to be clear, who are we including in Who's coming with us? Uh, Bill. The manager. <laughs> is there anyone else? No. Okay. Okay. Wants, you're I'll be here holding down the public line. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, motion second to go into executive session, including Bill. Um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed? Okay, um, so we're gonna, most of us are gonna hop off this line. We will return to this line to officially adjourn, but we will not be taking any further actions. Uh, okay, uh, I'll see you, everybody on the other side.